Good morning, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here this morning and to have the chance to, to chair and later to uh, talk about uh, the presentations you're about to hear. Um, there are not many times, um, in, uh, certainly in a researcher's life, where you feel that you are on the cusp of really finding out something quite revolutionary. And I think that the potential for what you're about to hear from this team um, really has uh, that, uh, that resonance to it. Um, telepolicing is something which I have to say pre-COVID uh, looked like a sort of kind of interesting idea that uh, probably would never have any legs because who wants to do that sort of thing? Well, the whole world, of course, has got used to doing things on screens, on phones, at a distance. And uh, so the research that you will hear about uh, this morning really rides that wave, I think. And it's, uh, it, it's a, a way for frontline policing to be conducted just as well, but um, hopefully, um, and we have evidence now to show, at substantially less cost than traditional uh, policing for certain kinds of offences. Um, and uh, we have someone uh, at, the, at the end of these presentations who will talk about ways in which those savings could be used to target the people who really need, need uh, the resources that you, uh, that you have the potential of saving. Um, but really credit uh, must go, I think, to Kent Police, um, widely defined, but particularly in relation to its innovation task force, um, headed up by uh, Graham Cooper, who uh, will speak to us in a moment to provide the context for what you'll hear uh, coming along later. But I, I think that, uh, that you'll feel as excited as we do um, at the end of this session about uh, something which really has the potential uh, to make police across the world really uh, think differently and behave differently um, more effectively and at less cost in, uh, in dealing with the calls they receive. So um, I'd like to open the session by um, introducing Graham. Uh, Graham, uh, the, uh, the head of the Innovation Task Force in, in Kent, um, a team which has really been responsible for some remarkable uh, research and implementation over recent years. And uh, so I'm going to invite Stacy Rothwell. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce. Uh, she's going to talk about um, a piece of research which really has set a lot of balls rolling, um, looking at the, uh, the effectiveness in a randomized trial of um, using phone policing, telepolicing one could say, um, as, uh, as a response and measuring it against business as usual for um, a certain categories of crime which uh, she's going to tell us about. Thanks Stacey. Um, yes, today I'm going to tell you about a randomised control trial that I did for my thesis. Um, essentially, uh, we will, as it says on the tin, um, the, the name of the study was Artrek. Um, it was Larry's uh, <laughs> idea to call it that, but that was um, a rapid telecommunication response to emergency and other calls. And essentially, I wanted to test the difference between an immediate phone service against our current, what was business as usual, uh, delayed physical attendance by an officer, um, looking at the differences between um, cost satisfaction, uh, cost effectiveness, sorry, and caller satisfaction. In more detail, um, really just to go through what it was I wanted to, um, to ascertain from conducting the study, um, there were essentially two st strands. Uh, the first was our uh, effectiveness, and that was probably and principally the most important thing, and how by changing our response to emergency calls, we could affect uh, victim satisfaction levels. Um, and secondly, then, to look at our cost efficiencies to accurately quantify and calculate the cost of sending officers to calls or alternatively doing an immediate telephone response. 
Um, it's important to note when I talk about this study and um, when Kent tells you about the next one that what we were looking to do was to uh, create an alternative first response service. So uh, this was an immediate response to calls as they were coming into the control room which um, we assessed for risk um, and, and dealt with without a delay or a call back to victims. So when um, I explain this study to people, I like to tell them the definition of first response and what that is. Uh, we probably all know this in the room, but it's, uh, you know, just to clarify, to send an officer to, to initially do the initial investigation, safeguarding of victims, um, protection of scenes, etc., etc. So that's what we were looking to provide an alternative for. Um, just so that you are aware, we ran the trial, the first this trial, over um, two phases, uh, pre, pre and post the first lockdown, and um, we had officers working at police stations and some officers working remotely, which worked really well. Um, yes, yeah, so essentially this one, um, the, the initial vision was to do a video response. However, as Heather has quite rightly pointed out, the appetite and the ability to be able to do that for this study was, was not there, so we proceeded with a telephone response. Um, just so that you're aware, when we're looking at call types for this study, um, we didn't focus on the immediate calls that require um, immediate attendance, nor did we focus on um, those calls that resolved without deployment um, or um, those that required a scheduled appointment. What we concentrated the study on are what are, I think, known throughout uh, the UK as priority calls, um, those calls that essentially require an, a, a delayed physical attendance, not immediately, but um, for us to get there as soon as we can. So some context, really. Um, this was quite interesting when I was studying the literature. The, the national picture is, is, um, is reflected of Kent's picture, but the HMIC and the MPCC both said that we're overwhelmed by demand, and the House of Commons Home Affairs Committee in 2018 said that police forces were struggling to cope. HMIC FRS did a study, a Peel study in 2018, and determined that a quarter of all police forces were um, struggling to manage demand and were stacking calls and not attending some. So um, it was interesting to, to know that. And some figures in 2018, there were 20, uh, 26 million uh, calls for service received by English police forces. Um, putting that into context into Kent, so this was the data that um, I got from 2019 and um, essentially showing that Bear in mind, we're only looking at telephone calls for service from members of the public. We had over 800,000 of those in 2019, and we then created from those around 270,000 incidents, um, and around a third of those were graded as this priority call type that I've mentioned to you. Um, and then we actually um, attended 55% of those calls. So um, they're the, the, the numbers, and when you calculate those, which I did in the study, um, that is around 300 that we needed to attend every day, which um, could be quite difficult to resource. So moving on to the study, um, it was quite an interesting time because, as I said before, one of the key things and principal things to remember about this for me is not the, the technology that we were using, but the service that we were giving to the members of the public. The calls had to be immediately responded to, so they would come into the control room, they would be assessed using this eligibility criteria, which I'll talk through in a moment, and then once they were assessed, we would then ask the victim if they wished to use the service. Again, another interesting, interesting concept in policing, because historically, we don't usually ask victims how and when we might respond to their call for service. We assess it, we triage it, and we provide what we, um, what we can, when we can. With this service, we give victims the choice. Interestingly, 95% of people in this study opted to choose um, the immediate telephone response. Once they chose that, they were then randomised into a treatment and control group. The study, um, essentially with the call eligibility, what we found, and, and when I speak to other police forces, this is really key, and, and Kent will talk about the different one in the next study, is that you needed a way in which you could assess calls for their eligibility. The first um, criteria was that it had to be a priority call, and as I've mentioned before, it had to be live and incoming. Um, so it was critical to be on the force control room floor, um, watching the incoming calls as the call takers were taking details 
to be able to capture them. We weren't able to call anyone back um, for the trial. Because this was a proof of concept and really embryonic in its stages at the time, we determined that we would uh, select non-domestic abuse call types because we didn't want to expose anyone, especially vulnerable um, domestic abuse victims, to any potential risk. Um, and we were very careful about um, which call types we would use. Um, I had, uh, I've worked in Kent Police for some time and never worked in the control room, so it was news to me that they had 61 different call types which aren't commensurate with crime types, so they're very subjectively applied and we were careful about which ones we would include and exclude. We had some fantastic um, senior responsible officers on the project. One of them is sitting at the back of the room, Mr Adam Ball, who supported us and helped us to select the relevant call types. Certain ones were ex excluded, such as rape and burglary for policy decisions, and other ones such as missing persons um, and sudden death uh, were excluded because it was an obvious um, choice that we would need to attend. So that's appended to the back of the thesis and actually quite interesting to look through that to see, to see which ones we um, included. And then lastly, and, and as I've mentioned previously, um, most importantly, that the, the, the victim opted into the service. What we found, though, that um, when we were just trialling the, um, the, the trial, that wasn't um, adequate and we needed a risk assessment for the calls coming in. So we created the 3P model, which was to protect life and property, prevent further crime and preserve evidence. And if we needed to attend now in order to do that, then we had to exclude it from the trial. And we recorded each of those. So that risk assessment was applied to every incoming call. This was our um, intention to treat, so you might not be able to see the numbers because we have to do big numbers, but um, essentially we had 450 calls um, that were part of the trial and 73 that were excluded. The 73 were excluded are the 25 or 5 percent that opted out um, and we had 48 where there wasn't an officer available to service the call. Moving to the middle branch here, the control group, of the 225 cases we had um, officer response to two-thirds of the calls, 69%, which are the three left boxes. So an officer attended um, a, a, with uh, the in, intended physical attendance uh, policy, an officer attended sometime later with a scheduled appointment, or um, there was a, a phone call response by an officer. Looking at that um, in percentages, which is quite a nice way of looking at it, what, when you look at the control group, just under half um, received physical attendance at some point from an officer and just over two-thirds received an officer response. So one-third didn't receive an officer response at all. In the treatment group, um, we had nearly all, 99.6% of cases, actually received the immediate telephone officer response. So as a policy, we were servicing nearly all of our victims and the one that was excluded was erroneously randomised. Um, how we've still kept in, in the trial and we didn't have an officer available to service it when that error was made, so it, it waited for um, two days or so for, for attendance and that affects my averages. <laughs> um, but of the 224 that were dealt with by an officer on the phone, we had three that were, or five that were put back on the list for attendance for various reasons. However, three eventually were resolved without, without any deployment and um, two did receive physical attendance. Um, so what was the main findings and the outcome? Um, so in answer to the, the questions I set out to answer, um, effectiveness, call of satisfaction in the treatment group increased by 23% when compared to the control group. Efficiency increased by 24% in the treatment group. Um, speed of response, victims received an officer response two days, 10 hours and five minutes sooner. And for an overall comparison, our trip was faster, more cost effective, and increased victim satisfaction than the current promised delayed physical attendance policy. Um, how we measured this, uh, we, we had uh, the, the, the two uh, options. Effectiveness was measured using a victim satisfaction survey. We got a response rate of 73%. Um, it was uh, administered by telephone mainly by me during lockdown, and, um, 
And, and what we uh, managed to find there was that 93% of victims were satisfied, as opposed to 69% with the usual business, as usual response um, in the control group. Um, some of the quotes from the control group, just to put some context to that, was uh, because I haven't in the control group because I haven't spoken to a police officer, anything could have happened. Um, and another quote was, I thought that it would be quicker than it was, um, and I was scared. Um, quotes from the treatment group include, uh, they dealt with it brilliantly, they dealt with it straight away, and oh well, uh, uh, sorry, oh well, get into to speak with the police officer straight away, relay my fears and calm me down. And it was, it was you know, actually having conducted many of those calls, um, the victims very much enjoyed that immediate engagement with an officer. We track the efficiency in different ways, so we use the geolocation um, software in officers' uh, personal radios and their uh, vehicles to track their whereabouts when they attended calls, um, to then measure the mileage and calculate the time and cost efficiencies. Uh, this graph is actually one of my favourite, and uh, Kent McFadden, a <laughs> fantastic affiliate from um, Cambridge, um, uh, helped to produce it with me, but essentially what this shows is that um, the, the darker line near the top is our treatment group and that within four hours um, nearly 100% of cases were resolved um, and dealt with, um, but some two days later there was only 57%, just over half of the control group that had been resolved and dealt with, so the remaining were still awaiting police attendance. So um, that I really think is, is quite impactful to be able to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, an immediate resolution, regardless of the technology we're using, is actually the key to, to the um, piece of work. These are some of the, the measurements we've got, and there's lots of numbers up there, so I've picked a, a couple that I thought would be of interest. Um, the average wait time for a victim on the control group was two days, ten hours, and, and five minutes. Um, and the, um, the first response time, so the, the, the one at the bottom, this, is, this shows us around efficiencies that um, for a treatment case it would take an officer on a telephone an hour and 18 minutes to do the telephone call and then do the associated administration and then it would, um, in the control group, it would take um, an hour and 42 minutes. However, quite interestingly, when you break it down further, um, it's nearly double um, the amount of officer time when you look at um, attending incidents because you would often send more than one officer and we calculated that um, and there would be the journey time that you would add in. So the efficiencies there were, um, were very good but like I said that wasn't our, our main, um, our main uh, driver for that, for the piece of work. Um, in fact this one's quite a good uh, graph that 90% um, of the victims would recommend, that, that received the uh, RTREC uh, intervention, would recommend it to others. And, and I thought that was you know, pretty impactful that they were that um, pleased with the service that they would um, recommend it to others. Um, lastly, uh, resource savings. So um, uh, yes, it, it, it is good that we are uh, able to make some cost savings, uh, reducing the cost of a call by one fifth. Interestingly, it halves when you look at actual physical attendance compared to RTREX, so it rises from £40.33 and pence to £79.17 and pence when we physically attend a call. So um, the, the savings there are, are, are substantial, I think, but, but more so and more the point, and I, and I wrote about this in my thesis, and it leads nicely onto the piece of work that Will's presenting, is that um, calls for service uh, are, we react, it's a very reactive um, policing method and um, I, I know Professor Sherman advocates proactive policing and what you know, that my um, suggestion would be that we use the savings to then proactively police and, and help our victims in other ways. So hopefully um, this, this has been interesting for you to, to understand really what was the, the principal study for us and um, the beginnings of um, what then um, Kent's going to tell you about, um, but a very different uh, response service for victims, uh, an immediate one, uh, one that they get when they call for help um, and we're able to immediately safeguard and protect them. We're able to um, use officers working remotely, especially during times of a pandemic, and, um, and, uh, and we can improve uh, our victim journey and our, our service to the public. The only one thing I forgot to mention through that was, and it was quite interesting, that 57% of the call types we dealt with were threats calls. 
Um, and that was quite interesting in itself, that such a large proportion were victims who were calling very frightened that something was likely to happen. And, and you know, call takers, they have to try and predict the chances of, of that happening and when it might happen. And to give them an officer immediately to be able to safeguard them, protect them, reassure them, take their details of crime reports, sometimes taking witness statements, that ability to be able to service people straight away um, was... Um, wonderfully simple, which is how someone from the HMIC described it for me. So I, 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 I'm really excited about this uh, for, for policing, um, and hopefully I know there's somebody in the audience who's looking to, to um, do some more studies and uh, do some extra research. So. Kent now uh, continues the story because um, Kent very innovatively um, has built on Stacey's work and, and the work of the innovation team um, in developing uh, the, the whole idea of uh, non-visit non policing, as it were, for uh, that category of victims. And uh, this piece of research is particularly uh, interesting because there has been so little done um, in exploring the needs of domestic abuse victims, and they were the central focus of of this study. So over to you, Kent, uh, to tell us all about it. Thank you, morning. Uh, so yeah, on the back of uh, our track, we obviously um, were able to, to, to look at other options of where we could take this. And the big picture, uh, the big ticket items for, for British policing is domestic abuse. So what I plan to do today is just give you a whistle-stop tour um, on what rapid video response is uh, who, is, who it's for, uh, how we put it into, into, the, into policing, and some very early results of our randomised trial um, that ran over 73 days uh, for 517 people. Um, so, again, we're putting victims at the centre of this. It's an optional service. It's up to them whether they would choose, um, uh, choose to speak with a, video, uh, with a police officer on video immediately when they make their call to um, the control room through 999 or 101 emergency number. Um, we allowed it for any type of domestic abuse, so female and male, both intimate um, and uh, intimate um, partner violence as well as uh, family violence, spousal and um, uh, the broader family, family harm. Um, we broad as we could for responding via video immediately. Uh, so just to put some sort of some context around uh, who this was for, uh, it was for domestic abuse victims who called where we didn't need to send attendance immediately. Um, so no immediate calls. Um, the, if, that was essentially defined um, by the principle that the, if, that the offender was not present and the victim was safe. Um, and we also, uh, for the trial, ruled out people under the age of 18, victims under the age of 18. Um, so those are the exclusions. Down the bottom of, of, of this slide, you have our um, eligibility criteria. So this, this is sort of the, the, uh, the, the more fine-grained rules about who we could and couldn't take into our study. Um, the key priority for us is obviously victim safety. So uh, we only took people, as I said, when they were... Um, safe to talk to us. Uh, because we're dealing with video as the means of communication, uh, we required the victim to be able to communicate with us effectively. The key areas uh, were either environmental, so they were in a very noisy location, very public place, uh, and we required um, the victim to, to mitigate those factors. So if they could move to a quiet place, we would be able to uh, run the, uh, they could participate in this trial. Otherwise, uh, they were, were excluded. Equally, some victims um, were excluded for uh, inability to communicate for other reasons, intoxication, uh, mental health. Again, we tried to mitigate these where we could, so support people for people with mental health um, challenges. Um, because we all, with, with this, and I'll go through shortly uh, the process, but obviously, with it being a response option, we. Um, we're not seeking to solve all their problems um, in the one, in, uh, one interaction. So if there were things we couldn't deal with, 
we would task them to be dealt with, with later, very much like a, a police officer who turns up to the door and would organise, uh, say, forensics later on, because it's not their expertise. We were the same, so we, we, if that people were safe and they wanted to do it, we would like we would invite them into the into the trial. Um, and and finally, obviously, the the requirement for for the technology. Um, if they don't have the video uh, technology or there's no service, we used a company called GoodSam. Um, who are well known in, in the medical um, telemedicine field. A lot of the uh, Babylon and NHS trust, trust stuff, I think they all use their, their software. Um, and they had a 95% use in, a um, 95% coverage in London. And obviously in the, in the counties, you, you have um, different reception, cell phone reception, different Wi-Fi technology. So some people uh, were un ineligible for the trial um, because they don't have the have the um, uh, ability to do it. Uh, so this slide looks different on this than it did on my presentation. So here we have um, six stages of lost model arrows. So starting off with the call taker who receives the call in the call centre. Uh, they would receive uh, the call from the victim. They would ascertain that it was domestic abuse um, and go through their risk assessment procedure and determine that it wasn't an immediate priority call so the victim, um, victim was alone and not with the offender uh, and the offender was either unlikely to return or we could secure, um, uh, keep them secure and safe. Uh, we'd complete that assessment and essentially grade them as a priority, so someone we would have to speak to um, uh, as a matter of, uh, it was a requirement but when we spoke to them wasn't, um, wasn't urgent at this point. Uh, so those two would fit into normal business. Most police forces would easily be able to have that done in the same way. We, we didn't change practice for those two. Um, the, third, the third one over on the, on the far right here uh, was our, we created a RVR dispatch, a rapid video response dispatch role. This role um, was essentially a, uh, like a, a normal dispatcher, but a virtual dispatcher. So we had in, in Camp Police, we have North Division, East Division, and West Division. So essentially, we had a North dispatcher, a West dispatcher, and an East dispatcher, and we added in a virtual uh, a rapid video response dispatcher who had um, all the calls that were suitable on their screen, and we could engage with the call takers to make sure we got the right cases. We also introduced for the trial a um, domestic abuse sergeant who had a dual function. They had a function to make sure that the victim was safe um, and a secondary function to make sure the uh, rapid video response officer uh, completed all the tasks that were required. Um, also sitting, um, which was either Stacey or I, was the RVR allocator. This was to run the trial. Um, we, this was where the randomizer sat. Uh, and, and, and this was the person who engaged with the victim, spoke with them on, um, on the phone and made sure that they consented to being in the trial, that they um, had the technology to, 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 to take part and that, that, you know, that their, their safety was um, paramount and would then do the randomizer. Um, and if it was in the treatment group, would send the um, victim to the RVR officer. In practice, how that worked was with God, Good Sam, we could send them a text message they would terminate the call with us, click on the text message, and immediately on their phone, uh, laptop, tablet, the, the officer would appear uh, and they could engage with them. Um, and any issues we uh, organised for the police officer to call them back and, and interact with them rather than the victim have to call back through the system. Uh, obviously, if it was a control case at this point, we returned them either to the high, what we called the high list in Kent Police, the priority list, where they would uh, get an attendance from an officer when available, or alternatively, we would give them an appointment over the next uh, three days uh, for either in station or at their house, so an officer could go and um, go and see them. We had the vast majority of people in the trial were, were uh, female intimate victims, about 69 percent, and then a small number of the other um, uh, the other groups: male non-intimate, male intimate, female non-intimate. We ran four, we had a block design trial. I'm not going into the details of that now, but it meant we ran them, these, um, these four strands through different uh, randomizers and, and kept them, them distinct. Um, interestingly, from a police perspective and with these victims, the same with our track, 
victims of domestic abuse, what we would call the mid-range um, domestic abuse callers, while we've put them as mid-range because we're not attending immediately, um, the victims consider it still very, very serious, um, or you know, um, only if there was over half here treated, uh, thought that their incident was serious, and um, I think one in five, about 5%, one in 20, said their incident was not serious at all. Uh, equally, they were very anxious at the time of their call. So this op opens the opportunity uh, for this type, of, this type of call where they would be waiting a period of time for an officer to turn up at their address uh, or having to wait for an appointment that they had scheduled. So this, um, this space for rapid video response to deal with immediately their anxieties and um, appropriately treat uh, the response um, to match their, how serious they think the incident is. Um, just a few um, reasons for why they, they called. When we spoke to them at the, about 10 days after in, the, in a victim survey, same as our track, uh, the, the vast majority of them just wanted to, to report the incident to police, and so it was on record. Uh, some wanted the uh, offender spoken to. Only 12%, the primary reason they called was for the prosecution of the offender. Um, speaking to Heather, that's similar to the, the CARA experiment. So, um, well, as, you know, for police, we, we think that um, prosecution is, is a high priority. It's, it's often um, less down the, uh, the, the, the hierarchy of the most important. These are, the, these are just the top, obviously, model. these victims would have many reasons why they call police. This was the main one they, they gave us. Um, so that's the overview. We just, have just started analysing the results, so I've only got two slides for you here, and I'm aware that I'm over, over the time. So this is the big, the, the big headline one for us. Um, when looking at victim satisfaction in the female intimate group, the, the, um, the female intimate satisfaction was significantly higher, statistically significantly higher, in that group than the business as usual um, response of the delay, you know, of the slightly delayed appointment or, um, uh, sorry, slightly delayed attendance or appointment. Uh, and there's obviously a few um, people who, who didn't get a response at all because as circumstances change. The interesting thing with this graph is a bit like our track, um, overall satisfaction in camp police for victims, and in, in this case of DA is very high. We're talking about 80%, um, which, is, which should be commended. And with the um, rapid video response, it's even higher. Um, a follow-up survey question asking them, the people who had ra rapid video response, if they would choose an immediate video response again um, over a delayed in-person response, 80% said they would prefer, an, if the circumstances were the same, and a, few, and a subsequent call to take rapid video response instead of a, a delayed in-person response. So to me that's, um, that shows that, that they um, enjoyed their experience um, as, as for, you know, in terms of what was comparative for dealing with their domestic abuse incident. Um, so some early findings, headline conclusions. Rapid video response is at least as good as business as usual. 80% of the victims received the rapid video response would prefer, prefer it over a delayed face-to-face, -face, and our female intimate partner victims were significantly more satisfied. We anticipate substantial uh, efficiency and effectiveness savings, um, which we haven't yet analysed. Uh, so there's more to come in this, uh, in this sphere, but um, that's all from me. Uh, and the journey we are on with rapid video response. Kent alluded, and uh, so did Stacey, to potential uh, financial savings that may arise out of this. Uh, this is very victim-focused research, but, and that is the priority to maintain that level of service or exceed what uh, Kent police are already achieving. Uh, but uh, they, they do look like it does look like there are real possibilities for saving some money here. So where would uh, those saved, funding, uh, saved funds be best expended? Um, Will Lay is going to talk to us now 
on his research, which is really about uh, identifying the victims whose need is greatest. Um, and so uh, let's hear where we'd spend our savings. Thanks, Will. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, my research is very much around trying to improve the targeting of victims. Um, so the research I conducted was descriptive analysis, um, focusing on different patterns within the distribution of harm. Um, so escalation from one offence to the next, looking at conditional probability of a further offence, um, the frequency of repeat victimisation, etc. But the, the main focus was around identifying concentrations of harm um, and trying to focus on that victim. So we've heard from Stacey's and Kent's uh, studies of the efficiencies that have been saved through those, so trying to identify where um, some, of that re some of those resources can be redirected. Um, so victims are no different to offenders or places, uh, as we know from Professor Sherman's work in Minneapolis, that um, crime is concentrated on very few micro places. Um, I think 3.3% uh, of places are responsible for over 50% of calls. And the same has been found for offenders, actually Ligon's studies as of many others. Um, and then you can see there that the same has been done for victims. So Gavin Dudfield uh, did the power few for victims and found that 3.75% of victims suffered 85% of the crime harm using the Cambridge Crime Harm Index. Um, interestingly, when you look at count, the same 3.75% only suffered 5% of crime count, which kind of shows the importance of focusing on harm. Uh, and then that was replicated by Will White, um, who's, as you can see there, 92% of the harm was suffered by 8.8% of the victims. Um, and when he did an exact replication, and the 3.75% for Will White in Avon and Somerset actually amounted to 79% of harm. So there clearly are concentrations of harm within the power few, or what probably better termed as high priority victims, as Mr Sherman has uh, identified. Um, so that's the purpose of it, is to try and find out around these concentrations of harm and focus more effort on those. But the issue is whether they're actually predictable concentrations. So to what extent can someone in the power few remain in the power few year on year? Um, we know that places are fairly stable because of the coupling of crime to place. Um, in Ashley Liggins' study around offenders, it was found that very few offenders remain in the power few year on year. I think it's between 2.2 and 4.4 per cent remained. So that's the main challenge, is to look at the same for victims. Um, so as you can see there, I, I, going back to the start, I worked out the power few for Kent. Um, I looked at six years of data, which was just over 677,000 crimes attributable to just over 380,000 victims. Um, so I analysed each year um, and looked at trying to identify the power few by summing each, each victim's harm um, and then identifying the cumulative harm and, and finding the different thresholds. So the graph you can see there overlays those six years. Um, and, and interestingly, the lighter blue line, which you can just see breaking away from the pack at the start, um, that's actually the six years taken cumulatively. So even when you look at it across time, there's still this pattern of, of the power few. Um, so, approximately between 13 and 15 per cent of victims suffer 80 per cent of harm year on year in Kent. Um, and that equates to just over 11,000 victims a year. Um, so we've definitely got the same patterns within Kent. But then it goes back to the, the issue of to what extent can someone in the power few remain in the power few, which extent do, do they remain, sorry. And there's, there's the two main issues in my mind. The first is um, that concentrations need to be predictable. If we're going to target resources through efficiency savings, through RTREC and RVR, then you need a prediction that's almost akin to having intelligence so that you can act on it and have a, a fairly good assurance that some of it will actually be usable. Um, so I worked on developing a predictive study um, to test that. The first thing in my mind was looking at the units of time. A lot of the studies just look at years from year to year, and in my head it was a bit of an arbitrary unit of time and trying to work out whether that was actually the best. So I looked at months, quarters, biannuals and years. Um, and did analysis to see which ones had the best uh, rates of prediction. And biannuals and years are fairly comparable. Um, months and quarters were established to be very poor in terms of prediction. I think month on month, no one remained in the power few, and quarter to quarter, only 1.3% remained. Um, so you can imagine my joy at doing loads of extra research to find out that actually years were the best unit of time anyway. Um, so we stuck with years. <coughs> um, so then the second point comes to feasibility. When I looked at um, Gavin Dudfield's work and Will White's work, they're really useful in setting that, those foundations. But the thing that concerned me is that 80%, when you look at um, Gavin Dudfield's work in Dorset, the power few were over 1,000 victims, um, or just under, sorry. And when you look at Will White's work, 
it was 13,500 victims, which best will in the world is not an achievable amount of people to target. Um, and through the work I've done in Kent Police, um, about 11,000, just over, as we saw, 11,000 um, would need to be targeted each year. So I tried to look at um, how to get that down, and the thing that resonated with me was from the Minneapolis study, the Minneapolis study funny enough, around the concentration on micro places. So I looked at trying to reduce down the power few cohort, uh, and I looked at several. So I looked at those number of victims that suffered 10% of cumulative harm, 50% and 80%. Uh, and thankfully, the 10%, the, the group that suffered 10% of cumulative harm, um, were actually the, the most accurate in terms of prediction. Uh, and co fortunately, they ov obviously also suffer the highest levels of harm. Uh, and that dovetails nicely into the fact that the 10% amounts to 250 victims, as you can see there. So that gives you an annual cohort to focus on of 250 victims. Um, and they, that amounted to just 0.31% of the victim population. Uh, so for Kent, we've got 13 districts, that's less than 20 victims to focus on a year, um, which in my mind it could be achievable. Um, so you can see there the cumulative harm score of those 250 victims. To try and give it some actual um, context, that's 776,000 people. If you convert it to offenders, that would be over 2,000 offenders locked up for a year. Um, in terms of victims, those 250 suffered the equivalent harm of 142 murders or 532 Section 18 GBHs, or over 77,000 ABHs. So that shows you the level of harm these 250 people are, are attributable to. And then when you do some qualitative work on those individuals, you've got a whole range of people. You've got people that I would term one-timers, but people that have only ever suffered one really high harm offence. You've got those that only ever suffered DA, those that only ever suffer violence, or those people that suffer across crime types. Uh, so you're generalists. And there was a victim in there that suffered violence, theft, robbery, burglary, rape, just across every crime type. Um, but there is still the issue of how accurately they can be predicted. So knowing that years are the most, uh, most accurate for prediction and knowing that the, temp the cohort that suffer 10% of harm are the best for prediction, from the first year to the second year, still only 7.87% survived from the first year to the second. Then that drops to just over 2% in the third year and then down to less than half percent in the fourth year. So it's still not particularly strong for prediction. So if you focus on those 250 people, by year two, only 18 would remain in the power few. So moving on from that, I looked at how important it was whether they stayed in the power few, because that's a title, it's an important one, it, it identifies them as suffering a concentration of harm. But actually, if they, we focus on those power few, are they still going to be victims in the next year? So when you focus on them like that and you use, look at them yearly and you look at the 250 victims, if you forget about whether they remain in the power few, your accuracy increases to 40% from 7.87%. So actually, those people, those power few, over about 40% of them still are victims in the next year. And the really important thing is their harm. So when you look at them, they suffer about 11 times more harm than other, the, the average, the mean of non power few victims. So they're suffering a lot more than your average, for want of a better word, victim. So they're still a, a worthy group to focus on, on the basis that your accuracy is much better and you've also got 11%, to, 11 times more harm. Um, so then the implications of that are this. It shows that there are a power few. We've replicated the previous studies. There's definitely those concentrations of harm. They can be identified and predicted to a degree. And actually, you can target resources on them through the efficiency savings of things like RTREC and RVR. Um, in addition to this, that's an existing resource that could be used now that that's been saved. But a lot of forces have dedicated in, uh, professionals that support vulnerable victims or that work in certain roles that already do something to proactively support victims. Um, so this is just a way of better directing those and, and supporting better targeting. The next thing on there is looking at flags. Um, Sir Dennis O'Connor mentioned in one of his lectures uh, a couple of years ago that actually they're underutilised. If you can identify these victims, flag them up to officers so that they know that the response needs to be different, you could build them into things like RTREC and RVR to flag them to the call takers and the dispatchers to know that these victims need an enhanced response. Um, so in my mind, that's a, a really important thing to do as well. Um, and then you look at implementation, there's several things. Firstly, the value of the having a crime harm index. Fortunately, through the work of um, some of the colleagues from Kent, we're finally getting a crime harm index embedded into a lot of our data. It allows you to look at insights like this, which crime, um, I did look at crime count, but certainly to a lesser extent, it doesn't give you the same insight and the same concentrations. So having crime is really useful. Um, I won't go to the ins and outs of my research, but data quality was a massive issue with missing fields, um, duplicates, all of those things inhibit research, and it does show you the importance of having um, good data quality. 
And the last thing is just around educating officers, not on everything, but on some of these core concepts so that when they see the flags, they understand what needs to be done as a response. Um, and then in terms of directions for further research, um, Mr Hooper mentioned in his opening that we're just sowing seeds, and this is very much that, it's the start of trying to look at prediction. But I think there's real value in overlaying more variables when you look at um, prediction. That 40% that is based purely on one variable, which is looking at prior victimisation. If you were to overlay other variables, for example, in my research, I know that over 78% of harm was suffered by females within one of my powerful cohorts. I know that when you look at age, the victims, the bulk of them peaked at age 16. That's, that's the greatest proportion of the power few, with other peaks earlier on. Even at age 12 was the first peak. So if you start to overlay age, gender, ethnicity, location, as well as prior victimisation, even offence type, you could start to improve that level of predictive accuracy. Um, I skipped one there. Uh, victim offenders is, is a really important area. So I looked at that again as a separate part of my research, not in terms of prediction. But my um, my direction would be that we should look at um, doing the same predictive analysis for victim offenders. So I took my uh, 380,000 victims over the six years, I did the same for offenders and found all the offenders for those six years, and I crossed the combined data set, just over half a percent, so 0.51% of that population of victims and offenders um, were both in the power few victims and power few offenders. But despite only being half a percent, they suffered 5% of the total harm and they committed over 20% of the total harm. So they are hugely disproportionately responsible for harm. And if you did the same prediction and could get accurate prediction, then you could actually make a, great, a much greater dividend and potential effect. Um, so in my mind, they're really worthy of focusing on, especially in the context of reducing serious harm, serious violence. Um, and then the last thing is, based on this, is just to take it forward and look at um, an RCT to see, work out this is just the first in that Triple T strategy to look at targeting. You need to overlay tested practices and then start to see what effect you could uh, produce by focusing on the power few cohort. Um, but that is my presentation. Thank you. Just a, a few words by way of summing up. Um, uh, I think uh, Will's work is really important because it demonstrates so clearly that it is possible to identify a manageable number of victims, identify those who are suffering a repeated high harm, and to focus your attention on those people. You can, you can name them, you know who they are, and those are the people who clearly are in greatest need of, of, uh, of protection. Um, and I think in the past, perhaps police agencies have been overwhelmed by the sheer volume of victims uh, in a kind of undifferentiated way. And the kind of work that Will has done um, really demonstrates how you can take that apart. And, uh, and make use of research in identifying where to put your resources. Um, and I think it's also worth p pointing out that uh, Will uh, built on the work of others and that uh, wherever we have looked, uh, which is not very many places yet, but nevertheless, the consistency of the findings is remarkable that such um, a high proportion of all the harm uh, is experienced by an incredibly small number of people. Um, so uh, I think the operational implications of, of those findings are very clear. Um, Will alluded to data quality uh, issues and, and of course it's always been the case that if, if police uh, don't believe that their records are going to be used or of any, uh, of any value, they won't um, fill out the form uh, properly. Um, I think that there is an, a, an increasing appreciation of the importance of data quality and much more rigor being applied um, for uh, the benefit of research. Um, Turning to uh, Stacey's and Kent's contribution, um, I think it's, it's very important to recognize that using randomized controlled trials, subjecting 
these uh, really new ideas to the, the most rigorous possible evaluation is incredibly important for establishing the credibility uh, and legitimacy of trying something uh, very new. Uh, these are not um, innovations that are doomed to success, as some people have said, um, that, they, uh, that they're always going to be regarded as, as the uh, product perhaps of, of a particular section of, of a police agency or of an individual and that um, there's just a general generalized opinion poll taken that something is a good idea. Not at all here. This is very, very rigorous research. Um, and uh, it's really, I think, to the credit of Kent Police that they have pursued this, they've, um, they've uh, used their own resources to manage these, um, these randomized controlled trials uh, with, uh, with some funding from, uh, from um, the Home Office, and they've put it to work in a very uh, clean way. And indeed, it's been a, a real privilege for me to be involved in this research because um, the, uh, the way in which the research was conducted uh, was really remarkably technically smooth. And you can imagine the potential for uh, confusion and delay uh, when you're, especially when you're going through the whole process of establishing eligibility for this particular trial. Um, and yet, while the caller waited on the line, uh, all of those steps that you, uh, you saw Kent uh, describe in establishing eligibility, in establishing safety, um, in establishing um, the issue of whether the, the caller had the technical um, capacity to engage in, in this way of dealing with their call. All of those things was done remarkably smoothly and demonstrated that this is a very feasible, doable program. Um, <clears throat> I also just wanted to draw attention to the fact that um, domestic abuse does encompass, of course, as we know, family, family incidents, um, even though in, I sometimes think in the public mind it's always uh, thought of as inter, uh, intimate partner um, abuse. And we did have both men and women, both um, family events and intimate partner events in the RVR study. Um, and you could see from what Kent uh, showed you that, um, that the level of satisfaction with uh, the video was at least as high in all of those four categories of, of people, um, but that it was remarkably um, in favor of RVR for the most uh, numerous category, which uh, was uh, the 69% who were um, women in intimate partner violence incidents. And I think that uh, this is something that, that has, has enormous ramifications. Um, and it's interesting to think about the reasons that um, that victims may prefer something on, um, on a video call rather than having a visit. Um, I think we sometimes underestimate the impact on uh, victims of having a police car roll up to your, um, <coughs> to your address and having uh, everybody in the neighborhood talking about what's going on at your place. Uh, these sorts of issues are, are not well understood um, and we, we sometimes sort of perceive them as if through a glass darkly, the way in which victims sometimes uh, react in <coughs> uh, counterintuitive ways to police actions. Um, and it, it, it also feeds into the whole debate about um, positive action for all domestic abuse cases when you see that only 12% of these victims uh, actually called the police in order for the police to prosecute uh, their offenders. 
Um, there's a lot we don't know about uh, what's going on here, and it's only through this kind of uh, rigorous research that we're ever going to, to find out. Um, but I think the bottom line in relation to, um, to both the uh, RTREC um, initial piece of research that Stacy was involved in, and of course the, uh, the RVR with domestic abuse, um, is to show that um, something new, something different, something imaginative um, uh, that uh, has the potential for being much more efficient um, and less expensive to run uh, can provide um, a closer approximation of what uh, victims seek when they, uh, when they call the police because they're not, uh, they're not often consulted about why they called the police. Um, and assumptions are made about uh, what the police are supposed to do. And I think that this sort of research is, is tremendously import, important for helping police officers to understand the complexity of what they're dealing with um, and to see the limits of what they may be able to do and what the victims perceive as the limits of what they're able to do. Um, so having said all, all of that, um, we have some time now for some questions if you'd like to uh, put them to um, our esteemed panel here. Um, uh, it's, it's a question for Stacy, if I may, um, around the efficiency of our trek and Apologies if I missed it um, in your explanation, but I was just really interested in the in the kind of average wait time. So the way that I understood it was that the, the treatment group had no wait time because it was immediate, um, but the control group, you said something about two days, ten hours, five minutes, and I was just trying to understand, in very plain English, the people that didn't take advantage um, of the offer how long did they have to wait before a police officer turned up at their house, on average? So the ones that were excluded from the trial because they opted out, is that your question? Because um, those 5% that opted out, yeah. we didn't measure that, albeit it's worth noting that if we were taking calls from that list, um, you would expect there to be a reduction in the time that they would have waited because there are less calls now on that pended list. So um, yes, you mentioned the two days and 10 hours, you got that exactly right. Um, there was a substantial, you know, some cases waited substantially longer, some were shorter, and what I noticed, and, and it's in the thesis, is um, that those that we responded to in person um, were faster, and those that we eventually resolved without deployment were slower. So there was a, um, an ability there, I think, to judge risk, um, but um, probably not precisely. So, so the two and a half days... Thanks. So the two and a half days, was, was that an average? That was an average, yes. So there's... A mean um, average? The, the mean average, yes. Lovely. There's Thank a maximum you. and a minimum in the, in the thesis. But. Thank you very much. So the, uh, the arm of the trial, which was business as usual, was the analogue for the people who um, uh, did not agree to participate. Uh, in other words, both those who didn't participate and those randomly assigned to business as usual got the same treatment. And that average of two and a half days, um, I think I'm right in saying, Stacey, excluded those who actually uh, never actually got a visit at all. Uh, no, that's not the case. That was for the entire um, control group, I think. Uh. It, it, it's, yes, hard, yes. it's hard to do an average when you never get the treatment. At all, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, 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 yes. yes you're exactly right. Yes. So, so that, that number was taken. Um, sadly, and, but you know, I don't. I'm not uh, seeking to pin Ken on this because I think it's the same everywhere. A proportion of cases just never, never received a visit. Um, so the two and a half days is the is the average for those who did ultimately get a visit. With regards to the rapid video response, I'm just really curious if you recorded the video response or did you not record and just take notes in your pocket notebook? Yeah, good, good question. Um, we, all, it was all recorded, everything was recorded. Um, and 
we followed the same d uh, data retention as we did for body uh, body worn video. <laughs> so, sorry. That's very interesting because one one of the things I, that policing would really like to do is to use body worn video to take uh, witness statements and victim personal statements. And I think there's still quite a bit of a way to go in that, that respect. So I think your journey is sort of building the foundations to progress that. Yeah, I know that we, um, the, I mean, it's really interesting. We haven't finished the analysis of it yet. Um, but we, we know we, uh, we had officers who took witness statements. Um, we had uh, jobs where we organized for the offender to be um, arrested what we think is much, much faster than would have happened if we were waiting for, a, um, waiting for, the, for an officer to attend first. Um, so that was positive as the others that we can think of. Yeah, um, the only thing I would add, um, we were very careful not to stray into AB territory. So although some were taken, um, we, were, we gave explicit guidance around when and when that should happen and our detective sergeant advised around that. But as Kent has quite rightly pointed out, um, we believe that it expedited those inquiries because we were able to take witness statements and task relentless pursuits of offenders. Immediately, in fact, one officer did that while she was on the call and got an officer to go out to arrest the offender while she dealt with the victim. And that's innovation. That's amazing. I was just saying that, but it's so innovative and amazing, and it would be really good if we could replicate that um, across the country. Thank you. So it's important to understand that there was no reduction in service, certainly, for the people uh, receiving the video um, treatment. Uh, everything was done exactly the same. Um, in Kent, they used DARA, not DASH, but that was, uh, that was administered. All the statements, um, uh, everything was as, uh, as it would have been if the officer had been physically present. It's a question for Stacey and Kent, and apologies, it's a bit of a multifaceted logistical question. Sure. <laughs> so when um, the call is resolved and an investigation is required, where does that go? Um, that's my first question. The second question is around when the victim doesn't want anything but maybe advice, certainly doesn't want a criminal justice investigation, did you adhere to the um, wishes of the victim and then thirdly apologies for these multiple questions but did you measure the overall investigative timeliness and whether actually um, the um, RTREC uh, investigations uh, were were quicker as opposed to you know as a whole through the police um, outcome process they're good questions, Adisa, and you might have to remind me of the first, of the first ones. <laughs> um, essentially, we, with the first response service on RVR and RTREC, we replicated what officers would have done in Kent on the front line. And in Kent, um, once we've done the initial response service, it would then be passed across to our CID or Vulnerable Investigation Team to take on board. So nothing changed with regards to that. With regards to did it um, get better outcomes, um, on our trek, actually, that was a really good question because on our trek, we didn't assess that. However, with RVR and we're just doing the data collection now, we're looking at a whole broad variety of outcomes, including um, the number of prosecutions, the number of victims that support prosecutions, um, whether or not we were able to ascertain any um, evidence their prosecutions. So we'll be able to hopefully fairly soon have some data for that. And your other question was? It was whether when victims didn't want a criminal justice investigation, whether you adhered to their wishes or whether you conducted a victimless prosecution. Yes, yeah, so um, obviously not, not, not so applicable to our trick, but with RVR, um, there has been a, a handful of cases that I know that officers were looking to proceed with that, but it's very early stages with regards to those investigations. We only concluded the trial just over a month ago, so we're going to keep a watchful eye on that, but the ability to have recorded those um, transactions and uh, at the outset, which was all um, made quite clear to the victim twice, they were told that it was going to be recorded and could be used in evidence. So we've been very upfront about that. But but as well, hopefully we'll be able to protect victims um, and use that evidence. Um, and CPS will engage with CPS on that. So thank you, Elisa. Um, a question for Kent, if I may. In relation to the rapid video response and DA, 
was one of the kind of, we won't do it if there's children present in the family, because I'm just thinking, although it's really innovative and really, really exciting, we need to be making sure we're getting people seeing those children to avoid, avoid any ACEs or, or issues in the future. Yes, so they, they were the front and centre in our risk assessments. Uh, it, we, we were happy to take, if, if there were children, there was two options. Obviously, there were um, the children present in the room and couldn't be in, were of an age where it would be um, problematic for uh, speaking with the victim. Those cases we, we would exclude. We tried to keep them in if we could, because you know, if children could be in a different room. Um, the voice of the child uh, piece, Again, because we were trying to focus on response as our core um, principle here, and, to, and um, of the assumption that if we couldn't do anything, we could all, always task it. So the voice of the child things, we tried to build in a system where you could, if, if there was a concern, we would send an officer to do follow-ups. Um, that was that was the principle. So we do we 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 wouldn't rule them, rule out jobs with children, carte blanche. But we 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 were very careful to make sure that children weren't exposed to. Um, uh, the, 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 what was being said, if, if, if it wasn't appropriate. I mean, you know, there were, we had baby, you know, times with babies and you know, um, things like that when they were present, and that was less of a concern for the because of the age. But we um, for, for overhearing, but obviously, if we wanted to check voice of the child as well. The only other thing that I would add, and it's not just for, for voice of the child, but what it enabled us to do was to engage with our partner agencies and do much faster referrals. So. Um, that was a real um, added benefit for us to be able to do that. But Voice of the Child was front and centre. Um, our assistant chief constable um, had highlighted that, that you know, we wanted to make sure we were able to, to do that. And an officer actually um, that worked on the trial said she, she found that it was, that, that victims were quite relaxed on the video and that they would allow you to see their house more openly than if she were, she was a frontline officer, than if she were in attendance. And, and so she got a real good, um, ability and build real, built real good rapport, she felt, with, with the victims. Yeah, just one last thing on there. There was an interesting, I mean, it's a sort of a, a case study example where the, the, we're just told from the officers, because it's immediate, you see things when it, almost when it happened, much closer. So if the coffee table's been tipped up, it'll still be tipped up. If the children are upset, the children are still upset. When you turn up a few hours or days later, that may not be the case. And that we did hear some stories about that. So um, the evidence capture on those for, for protecting um, children and, and obviously victims is, is enhanced. Thank you. And this is a question for Kent and Stacey. Um, first off, just to confirm, the service you talk about, was that held within the force control room or did it go to another unit? Sorry, can you just repeat that? So the services you're talking about, was it the force control room operations who dealt with this service or was it pushed to another, <clears throat> another unit? Um, so essentially, our research team were based in the force control room. Um, that we had a dispatcher there that Kent mentioned that was select, helping us to um, identify the calls and make sure we didn't miss any. The call takers would refer them immediately through to myself or, or Kent or uh, we had another script reader who would then deal with the victim and keep them on the phone. And then what would happen in both trials is we would either instantly connect them to the officer via telephone without any um, transmission through any other department or we would send the Good Sam link that Kent has mentioned and we would wait with them on the phone to ensure that they receive that. And that process generally took about 30 seconds to a minute for us to be able to administer but to make sure that we we didn't lose any victims or um you know or there were any technical difficulties what became apparent from doing both trials actually that was relatively easy and officers could work from home and it means you can use restricted officers to be able to do that so it, it was in the end actually quite a, a lovely seamless process but at the beginning when you're looking at all the technical bits of your in your it and your organizations it can be a little bit daunting but we got it well. I suppose the second one for me is what barriers did you face implementing both the processes? Um, in, in implementing the, the, the randomised control trials, I suppose um, uh, initially and um, throughout and even now, uh, some officers say that it's the better service to have a physical um, interaction with an officer and, and that's an assumption on, on their part really which is why the victim satisfaction piece is so important because we're, we're making the assumption you know when I was an officer that when, I, when you turn up somewhere that that's going to somehow make everything better 
um, they're calling and they want resolution and they want it immediately. And especially repeat victims that I spoke to during the DA trial, um, they were really, really excited about the fact that they would get an officer there. And then, and I liken it to when you phone the bank and get shoved from department to department, department and you don't get resolution of your issue, to have that immediate resolution, that immediate safeguarding and protection, immediate referrals, your, your call logged immediately, to be taken seriously, that, that was really helpful. But culture shift with regards to the control room initially, there was lots of engagement of winning hearts and minds and sweeties and things to, to, to get everybody on board. And then also even officers and, and even some of the um, RVR officers, you know, initially that it, it took a while for them to understand that we were trying to test whether or not it was better. And we wouldn't know until we got the results. So that was difficult and, and implementing an RCT also <laughs> challenging at times, but Ken's got something to add. Yeah, and also um, it's the, the uh, unmeant, the, the always happens in these things, but as unmentioned often is the amount of work uh, about IT and technology. Um, so, I mean, Stacey spent hours and hours and hours on information security, um, just the technology, just getting the system in place so you could send the links. You know, we're, I mean, the Good Sam company we were um, paired with, uh, the, you know, very, very supportive, but there's a lot of work in that area which, um, which often doesn't get spoken about, but it's, it's, it's a challenge. But I think the bottom line is that they did do it, and um, uh, they know now how to do it, and I'm sure would be more than happy to uh, share their expertise with anybody else interested in, in taking this on. Um, it, it sounded, I must confess at the outset, dauntingly complicated to make, uh, make this whole whole uh, uh, technical system work, but um, it, it really worked seamlessly uh, throughout the whole uh, 500 calls. Um, very few dropouts, very, very few technical hitches at all. So um, uh, I think that the technology has been nailed and uh, it's, it's really a, a very viable option for any police agency now. Next session is an hour with three speakers and we are exploring that vexed question of how you can predict who are going to be the next violent offenders and the sort of steps that you might be able to take to uh, intervene to stop it happening. Um, so Lorraine uh, is going to be speaking uh, about her experience, very recent research. Um, that's looked at, at the sort of nexus between uh, offenders and victims and, and the predictability of that pool. Uh, Sarah Valde Benito is, is going to be speaking too about, about um, the predictability of, of offenders. But first up, um, a stalwart, globe trotting, uh, here today, uh, Geoffrey Barnes, um, to open up proceedings. Geoffrey. Okay, so I've been coming to this conference for many, many years. Uh, I think in 2016, possibly 2015, I promised that the research we were doing in Durham would eventually yield the story of whether human beings or the machine learning algorithm that we built up there would produce better forecasts. And I've been promising that every year. Uh, I was ready to tell you about this in 2020. I don't know why I didn't come and do it. Um, I, I, if I ever get down to the bottom of that, I will figure it out. Um, so I will finally be able to reveal exactly the complicated story of how these forecasts turned out. But before we get to Durham, let's instead take a quick look at one other instance in which we kind of know how police officers are forecasting what is going to happen. And then we built a machine learning algorithm and we can lay them side by side, at least to an extent. So, um, we built this algorithm in, in, um, in Hampshire that, for, that broke the offenders down into three groups. So forecasted high, high risk was just in the, in the intimate partner violence sphere, um, would there be a repeat of a new serious offense? And the offenses are listed up there. You can read them as well as I can. Moderate risk was there would be some more repeat intimate partner violence, but it would rise to that level of serious behavior. And forecasted low risk was there would be no new intimate partner violence in the next two years. And when we built the random forest model, what we could see was that we, we got this level of success. So 
these three squares here are places where the model predicted exactly the behavior that transpired over the next two years. Um, that means that these are the errors that took place. Um, these specifically are the sort of, um, these are the uh, cautious errors. So we're making a forecast that is higher than what actually happened. So in the top row, that 4.6%, we're predicting that something really, really bad is going to happen um, with this offender. But in actuality, only moderate risk behavior took place, or 2.9% of the cases, um, low risk behavior. So if these are the cautious errors, these are what I would call the more dangerous errors, where we underestimate how much risk is posed by these offenders. Um, so this is what we have when the random forest model does its work. Um, now the next question is, there were dash, um, in all these cases, there were dash measures taken by the constable at the scene of the, of the domestic, and they made a rating as well about how risky the situation was. So you kind of have to watch the screen at this point because these squares are going to change in size. If, if the colored boxes get bigger, it means the constables did a better job. If it gets smaller, um, that's not really the case. Um, and I could flip back and forth between them a little bit, but basically all the colored boxes got bigger or got smaller. So not great news for constables making risk forecasts on the scene using Dash. However, there is a hidden subtext to all this information, and that is this bottom row that we don't talk about. Um, the Dash was available. This should have been used, but in fact, um, it wasn't used a disturbing portion of the time. So the first thing we learn when we compare random forest algorithmic forecasting to uh, human, human beings doing the forecasting is that 16.5% of the time the human beings decided not to make a forecast, or at least not one that was recorded in the information systems that were available. Um, of course, the algorithm didn't make that mistake. Just remember when I said that when we get to Durham, because um, sometimes algorithms make the same mistake. But at least in this case, it was an academic exercise of building the model, so it made a forecast in every case. Um, so the next question is, now that we know how often no forecast is produced, how often do these other forecasts take place? Um, so a high-risk forecast takes place um, almost one out of five cases with DASH, but only one out of 10 when random forest is used. Um, random forest is much more likely to pick uh, moderate risk forecasts or standard risk forecasts, standard low risk forecasts. So this is what everybody always wants to talk about, the overall accuracy. If you've attended my talks on random forest before, you will know what I'm about to say which is, this is a lovely measure. It looks all that impressive. Look how well Random Forest did compared to the officers. However, never, ever pay attention to the overall level of accuracy. It's not a great measure. There's a lot of reasons for it. I won't get into all of them. But really, that's not what's important when you're building one of these algorithms. In fact, it's not designed to produce the highest level of overall accuracy. It's designed to do something else, which we'll get to later. Um, but when you break down the, act, the, the different actual risk categories, so out of everybody who was actually high risk, meaning they went on in the next two years to do something serious in the intimate partner arena, um, the model was successful in identifying them 51% of the time, whereas the police officers only 35% of the time. Um, the model also outperformed for moderate risk and for low risk. So, so far, go model. It's doing great. Um, the next question would be, okay, so let, let's reverse what we're saying when we're talking about accuracy. Let's instead talk about out of everyone that either the model or the officers forecasted as low risk or medium moderate risk or standard low risk, out of everybody in that, which one did better? Well, the model wins again and again and again. And we'll say these percentage here, I've taken out that bottom line where there was no forecast at all. So we're only looking at ones that both the model and the officer made a forecast in. Um, but the model, model is doing great. However, there is this little fly in the ointment. If you turn the, over the back of the paper or the Microsoft Word or PDF dash form that is, was used in Hampshire during the course of this data collection, um, you'll see that when, when, I, when we built this model, we had to be very specific about what kinds of behavior we were forecasting. Dash is a lot more um, flexible on what it's defining. So like in medium, there are identifier, identifiable indicators of risk of serious harm. What does serious harm mean? 
Uh, we, well, whatever you think is serious. We, we're not going to get too specific about that. Um, and you can see the same thing in high risk. They talk about serious. And they define it as a risk in which life threatening and or traumatic from which recovery would be difficult or impossible. But even that, okay, so how much injury does it take until you know, is that GBH, was it life threatening, was it life changing or not? Um, it's, it's a little fuzzy, whereas, whereas our random forest outcomes are much more specified. So it's not clear that they really align. Um, I think it's worth going through these. I have to do it real quick, not a lot of time, but I, I really like confusing my audience, so I'm going to go ahead and put these up. Um, now, when random forest runs, it can produce this great measure of how important each predictor is, and that's along the bottom here. It says, how much forecasting accuracy would the model lose if we omitted that variable, if, if we took it out so it couldn't be used anymore? And it, it's a very intuitive, very clear measure about how important a variable, variable is. But what's really important is that every variable has different importance for producing a low risk forecast, for producing a moderate risk forecast, and especially for producing a high risk forecast. Some predictors are really important for high risk and not important at all for low risk. So what I've done here is I've broken them out into blue and, and amber and red to show you the, the, the low, the medium, and the high. Um, so for example, age of the victim, um, that turns out to be pretty important for both high and low risk. You've got a pretty decently sized blue bar and a de pretty decently sized red bar. Um, the police sector location where the, where the incident took place, that is very important for high risk, but not especially important for low risk. Um, and I probably won't go through all of these. Um, what is interesting to me is where we brought Dash in. So this is where, this is all based on prior offenses. Um, so how many incidents took place, um, how, many, how, how many different offenses, and how old the offender was when the first one took place. And you can see some things are very important for both, low and high. Others are only important for one. But what's really interesting to me is when we put the dash measures into the model itself, and we said how important, how important are these predictors in predicting? Now these are only the instant dash, and by instant dash I mean the form that was filled out on the night of the event that we're running the forecast here the very next morning. Um, and what's important there, there's no history, it's just how bad were things looking last night. And you can see there's almost no predictive importance at all for most of the questions on dash, the dash that we filled out last night at least. Um, the biggest measures come from simply adding up how many yes responses there were, regardless of which question that was. Um, the overall rating, whether it was low, medium, and low, low sta sorry, standard, medium, or high, um, that, that's the next most important. But the individual questions themselves, not very important. But where Dash actually gets some predictive importance is when we begin layering on all the prior dashes that took place all the way up through last night. So when you add all those together, we start getting a lot more predictive importance, especially towards the red side of these bars. Um, yes, the, the number of prior dash yes, uh, sorry, the number of prior responses that were answered yes is still the biggest one. It's got good blue power and good red power, but most of these are red power. But it's interesting that in order to make dash useful, you have to look back over the entire history of that offender and not just at what happened last night. Okay, so what was the problem with doing Hampshire? Um, a lot of them, there were some missing, missing dash forecasts. Um, we only had a limited history. Very labor intensive to gather up all the dash. Um, the, human, the human risk est estimates that were made here weren't really directly tuned to the same outcome that we used in the random forest. Um, and it was, well, there's just, just a whole list of responses there, but really I probably need to move on and tell you about Durham. So, Remember when I told you that the algorithm always makes forecasts? Um, that isn't necessarily the case when you're relying on a human being to type the information into a bit of information in the computer and hit a button to trigger the algorithm to run. So that's the way custody sergeants ran the risk forecast in Durham. So I built a Venn diagram. Um, blue are how many times a custody record was started in Durham during the period of this analysis. Red is how many forecasts you, they made. You'll notice that not every custody record has a forecast, and indeed not every forecast was made for a custody record. I don't know whether people were 
looking at uh, running forecasts on the people that uh, bullied them in school or what they were running, but there were forecasts run that had nothing to do with custody, or at least not a link that I can found. So what we ended up doing was these about 6,500 instances in which, the model, in which the model was triggered by the custody sergeant. So all of this, it isn't, it isn't based on all of Durham's custodies, it's only based on this subsample. So back when I, so when we first built the model, this is the level of accuracy that we thought we'd have. So again, the red, the yellow, and the blue box, those are the important ones, that's where the model was accurate. Um, in the operational use, however, we did end up with this disturbing bottom row, just like we had in, in Hampshire, where no forecast was run. Um, now I'm gonna do that little trick again, but don't pay too much attention, because I'll do it again later. Um, and this is, what, this is what the sergeants did. Of course, the sergeants, if the sergeant didn't trigger the forecast to, for the model to run, they also didn't supply one to compare. So you can see that percentage along the bottom that we lost, that we weren't able. So I think this part's really important. Is there a difference between the people who got put through the forecasting algorithm and the people who were not? Because if it's not different, then we didn't really get a, a, a representative sample of all custodies in Durham. So what do we know? Well, we know that people who were forecasted were significantly more likely to be male. We know they were likely to be older. That's probably because absolutely no juveniles were run through the model whatsoever. Um, only adults were run through the model. Um, so right there, this is a very different, unique subsample of the Durham, pop, Durham custody population. There was a difference in how many offenses they, were, they brought into the custody suite, but there was not a significant difference in how much violence or how many serious offenses they brought in on the day when they were arrested. Um, there was also no difference in their harm scores. In fact, those two groups are almost exactly equal on harm. But there were other differences. Age of onset was significantly different. Prior history was significantly different. The people who got forecasted had more of a prior history. So probably what you're most interested in is when people were forecasted, were, what, did their, what did their outcomes look like? Um, so this plots everybody over the next 24 months. And, it, and at 24 months is when we were done forecasting. So to show you the, where we stood then, um, if you were forecasted, you were about 33% more likely to have committed a new offense in those next two years. And for violent offenses or for serious offending, you were about 26% more likely to exhibit a, a subsequent serious offense. So everything I'm about to say is based on a subsample that was a little bit more serious than your typical Durham offender. Very important to keep that in mind. All right, so these are completed forecasts only. And this is what the model did operationally. So you can see its level of success. You can see its level of errors. Those error boxes are, are if you could actually remember the previous one, those error boxes are a little bit bigger than you would have expected. But again, that bottom row of non-forecast of non people, that's now removed. We're only looking at people who got forecasted. So these dotted lines are there to show you what the model did so that when I put in what the sergeants did, we can see what the difference is. So the model identified a lot more accurate reds. They identified a lot more people where, the, where, the, where they got an accurate forecast of high risk behavior. The sergeants produced a lot less of those. But the sergeants did a little bit better on producing moderate risks. And it was pretty much a tie on low risk. Um, now, as, now, when I say it was pretty much a tie on low risk, I'm talking only about the blue box. Notice these other two low risk boxes down here where the model produced fewer errors. So if you're wanting a story about how the model is always better, things are getting a little bit more complicated. Um, and I especially want you to pay attention to this box because we're gonna talk about it later. So these 19% that were forecasted as moderate risk, but actually committed no new fences at all. They'll be important later on. So overall accuracy, which again, we all know is a terrible measure. The model did 3% better than the sergeants. Doesn't exactly sound overwhelming, but again, not the measure I would choose to focus on. Um, both, both the sergeants and the random forest produce forecasts 51.7% of the time, which isn't great. Um, we, we wish we'd forecasted a bit more. But when we get into more specific things, so out of everybody who was forecasted to be high risk, the model did 30% better. Out of everybody who was forecasting moderate risk, essentially a tie. Sergeants, a little bit better, but essentially a tie. Um, and then, this especially is important. When we forecast low risk and we say, please, you, you don't need to worry about this offender, 
who does a better job? Well, actually, both the sergeants and the model do a really good job. Those are really healthy percentages, but the model does do 19% better. Now, when we get into the actual, some of these numbers get extreme. So out of everyone who actually committed a serious offense, the model identified 31.5% of them. Um, the sergeants identified a lot less. So the, while, while you may not be impressed with, those, with a 31% number, it's a lot better than what a human being would have given you. Um, moderate risk, the sergeants do a sizable percent better. Um, and then in actual low risk, the model does just a little bit better. I know all this is getting complicated. There are other ways to summarize this, however. You could say, let's calculate an odds ratio. So when we forecast you to, to have high-risk behavior, how much more likely are you to exhibit high-risk behavior? When the model makes that forecast, you're three times more likely to exhibit that behavior compared to only 1.7% when the sergeants make that forecast. So if, again, um, the model does better for high and low, does a lot better for low. I mean, a lot better for low. Um, but, it does, but the sergeants do a little bit better for moderate. So I thought about this and said, this is a little bit weird. Um, the, the sergeants, looking at the data, what was happening was the sergeants were very happy to pick the middle of the road and make the moderate risk forecast. They were less comfortable making the extreme forecast of either high or, or low. They didn't like doing that. And if you forecast a lot of people to be moderate, you're, li you're likely to soak up most of the people who actually are moderate. Um, so what I chose to do was convert these measures into error costs. Um, remember when I circled this one box over here, this 12.2% over here that were, that were forecasted to be uh, moderate risk but actually were low risk? Turns out that's the most common error for both the sergeants and the model. And in fact, they make the error almost exactly the same amount of time. So arbitrarily, I'm going to give that an error cost of one because it's the most common error. It's the because it's the most common, that means it's the least expensive error to make. So when you make a lot of errors, you would make the ones that were cheapest most often. So that gets a, an error cost. And then from there, it's just simple division to figure out how much error cost all the other errors on these boxes have. So this big 14.8 down here, what that means is that this error took place 14.8 times less frequently than the most common one, meaning that it costs a lot more when somebody makes or when the model makes that particular error. So that would be something when the model is built, when the model is running back in the like, backstage, what's actually happening is it's trying to minimize these error costs. It's not trying to produce the most accurate forecast. It's trying to get the smallest number on this. So. Let me take a quick time check and make sure I'm not running over. Oh, no, I'm doing pretty good. Um, so how well does, the, so you've already seen this, this thing. This is where the model did 3% better in overall accuracy. And you've heard me say now twice, I'll say it for the third time, don't pay any attention to the overall accuracy. It's not a great measure. But when we put the error costs into the equation and we say, which of these two methods produce the smallest error cost? Then what you get is this. The model produces 18% less error cost. In other words, it does 18% better at, in, in its level of minimizing those costs. And meanwhile, the sergeants, sergeants make you know, slightly fewer errors, but when they make them, they're more likely to make the most costly ones. Um, we can do the error costs for everybody that was forecasted as high risk. The model does 38% better. Moderate risk, which the sergeants get right, but when they get it wrong, they end up making the more expensive error, whereas the model aims to the least expensive error. So the model actually beats the sergeants on error costs for moderate risk, which I didn't expect. Um, and it does 47% better for low risk. And the more I've worked with these things, I want to emphasize how important the low risk group is. Uh, it's very easy for senior officers and judges and people who commission this work to focus on those high-risk individuals, but really it's the low-risk people that you need to get right because that is where we can reduce our level of commitment, reduce the amount we're spending on them, and devote those resources towards the higher risk. So we really can't afford for the low-risk forecast to be wrong all that often because every error that happens on a, with a forecast that's low-risk is by definition an offender who went out and did something more serious than we thought. 
and we want to really minimize that. That's, that's where that big 14-point error cost takes place. All right, so this is new. Nobody's seen this before. So I'm, I'm, I know it's hard to read, especially from the cheap seats. Um, these are the 34 officers in Durham who used the model the most. So all of them used it at least 40 times during the, during the about, about 10 months that we were doing this research. So they did use it a lot. We have good data on them. We know every offender that they used it to test. And of course, we have their own forecast. So I thought it would be interesting if we would to, were to put those officers alongside how well the model did for the exact same offenders. So basically, I know it's hard to read in the back, but the, but the blue dot is how well the officers did, and the green dot is how well the model did. So since we're measuring overall accuracy, which fourth time now, not a great measure, but everybody loves it, so I keep putting it up here. But when we, when we look at this, if, the, if that officer did better than the model, the blue dot will be to the right of the green dot. It will be higher than the green dot. So there are 12 out of these 34 instances, so 35% of these officers actually outperform the model in this measure of overall accuracy. However, there are a lot where the model's green dot is well above what the sergeants produce. And there's officer B10, um, kind of about halfway down, um, who you can see that the model did a lot better then. So that green dot is way above, above the blue dot. Um, now what's interesting here, obviously I'm not giving you their names, but I want you to, you to pay attention to the fact that I gave them names where I've basically broken them into three groups. There's group A, so there's officer A01 through A, A11. There's group B, B1 through B12, and then C1 through C11. The reason I did that is so you can see this is sorting them in order by how much overall accuracy they produced. So the people that did the best are at the top, people that did the worst are at the bottom, and you can see where the model did. Um, that's all well and good, but um, again, I don't really like this, over, this overall accuracy measure. So let's bring in that cost measure and see how things change based on what the model was actually tuned to produce. And in this case, the first thing I want, to pay, want you to pay attention to is look at the names, the fake names of the officers along, along that edge. Um, officer A01, is, who was the most accurate officer, did not produce the lowest error cost. In fact, I don't even know if I can find A01. There he is, or she is. Um, I've recently learned you can do this and make a little laser pointer. So that's where they are. But they didn't actually do, um, they actually did beat the model on error costs because they, they um, no, the officer produced more error costs than the model. So they did not. In fact, only four out of these 34 officers managed to beat the model, outperform the model in producing a lower error cost than the model did. Um, so that, that uh, four out of 34, 12%. So when you actually look at this measure, and again, this is what the model's tuned to do. It's designed to, it's designed to produce not only accurate forecasts, but to minimize, when it makes a mistake, to minimize the cost of those errors. Um, the sergeants didn't exactly do that. They, they, made, they made them a different way. Um, so in any event, um, this is where individual officers stand. But what fascinates me is just how the order changed. It's one story when it's, sorted in order by who was the most accurate, it's entirely different order. I mean, Officer C10, who had like the, almost the, the second worst accuracy percentage, actually managed to produce the, the lowest error cost. So yes, they made, they made more mistakes than others, but they were cheaper. All right, so what are the conclusions here? Um, first of all, if, if you have a forecasting tool, if you go to the trouble of making one, please use it. Um, don't let it sit there unused 51% of the time. Um, or sorry, 48% of the time. Um, missing forecasts are very difficult. Um, boy, somebody loves me. Maybe I better turn this thing off. Um, but the, uh, the missing forecasts that we had in Durham make it very hard to know whether the model was or was not accurate, but I think we got past that. Um, modern forecasting techniques will generally outperform human judgment, and I hope I've convinced you of that. But it's not always an enormous advantage and it's a lot more complex than you might think. If this was a Facebook relationship status, it would definitely be, it's complicated. Um, you can't hold algorithms to a standard of perfection. If you want to know whether an algorithm did well, you need this human comparator 
to know how, what would have happened if the algorithm wasn't in place. It's basically the equivalent of a control group. But algorithms are, are not only a little bit more accurate, but most importantly, to me at least, they are more consistent and they're more transparent. Granted, there are several million decision points in the Durham model, but at least we can open them up and see what they are. We, we can look at that and, and diagnose it. You can't do that with a human being's judgments. Um, and finally, I always finish with this slide. Um, forecasting is not really evidence-based policing. The evidence-based policing part kicks off after the forecast is done. And the question is, now that you know someone's high risk, or low risk for that matter, now what? Now what do you do? So go off and do something, but do it as a randomized trial so we can actually do some evidence-based policing. I'm Lorraine Hilder, I'm a DCI from the Met, and my thesis topic was the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences among prolific young robbery offenders in London. It was an exploratory study. Um, now, ACEs, I think everyone in the audience will know, don't actually have a legal definition, but they refer to traumatic events in, or chronic stresses in a child's life under the age of 18. So I'm from the Met and reducing violence is our number one key priority and our MPS vision is to be the most trusted police service in the world. And this part is really key to me, to keep London safe for everyone. So my research question was using crime and intelligence reports held on our Met police systems what is recorded about antecedent and traumatic events defined as adverse childhood experiences in the lives of our prolific young robbery offenders in London who are aged 25 years or under? So I'm going to talk you through how I did this study um, and most importantly my findings and then what we could do better as the police. So in 2019 there was 37,043 personal street crime robberies in London. Now, I wanted to remove any of these where the parties were known to each other. So I excluded any um, domestic violent cases um, and any commercial or organised robberies. Now, the Met solved... 1,936 robberies that year. We average on about 10% of solving robberies in London. And this year was particularly bad. We only solved 5%. And that left me with 1,249 unique offenders. Now, what I did next was I rank ordered these worst or prolific robbery offenders. And I got down to a cohort size of 81. And my 81, so the worst offender in um, 2019 was M1, and M1 committed 16 robberies that year. And when I say committed, that's how many the CPS charged them with. They were accused of having enough evidence to take to court 16 robberies in that year. And... Uh, obviously, we believe from intelligence they committed a lot more than that, but my cohort consisted of the power few that had been taken to court four or more in that calendar year. And then essentially, I had a deep dive look into their lives on everything we knew about them in terms of victimisation and offending. And I looked in our database. Now, we've got a database in the Met called the IIP. It's an integra integrated intelligence platform. And that combines all of our crime reports, our stop and search data set, our missing persons platforms. So I had a good deep dive looking into these 81 offenders' lives, looking for ACEs, which I will talk about in a, in a moment. And I also put, looked for eight additional trauma factors, such as exclusion from school, how many times they're going missing. Now, what I found, firstly, this took an incredible long amount of time because we don't in the Met, and I don't know, probably most forces, don't actually list ACEs as part of our criteria. But when I was reading about these children's lives, what I found was we always treated the last in incident as one incident and we weren't going back looking at previous offending, previous victimisation. 
And this was echoed in the, when I was doing my literature review of an HMIC report, which found that the police responses really do focus on dealing with children's behaviour and not understanding their vulnerability. We were also criticised that officers do not always understand or recognise what's happening in these vulnerable and at-risk children's lives. And we're not using multi-information to help understand a child's situation. So obviously I needed a comparator to my study. And, to, um, and so firstly, I will... I'm, this is my results, and this is what... Um, what is, what is the normal amount of ACEs that someone has in their lives. So I'm sure you all know the original ACE um, founder was Folletti, and he's from America, and he really he found ACEs by chance. He was looking at a group of 50 um, obese people, um, and he found that when he was asking them questions, like why do they keep then putting on weight, he established that um, a lot of them had been the victims of serial, serious sexual assault. And when he asked um, when was the first time um, they lost their virginity, the first few people he was speaking to said age 10. And then he realised they'd suffered this trauma and that they were using and they were kept on gaining weight because they hadn't actually addressed the experiences that they had had as a child. And if, if you look at the first column here, um, these were, and then he got many, many ad other studies, and this was the cohort of what the adverse, the 10 adverse children experiences were. When I looked at my group, you will see instantly the next column is Asmussen. Now, Asmussen is a UK study. Um, they're part of the Early Intervention Foundation, and they're an independent charity, and they support the use of effective um, life interventions early on in children's lives and they did a study looking at all of the trauma therapy that is out there in, in, in the UK and um, what, what interventions actually worked. But this study was really useful for my study as a benchmark. And if you look, they, what they did in this next box on the right above where I've got my findings, Asmussen contacted all of the public health, all the charities, all the um, London boroughs. Not everyone replied, but they got a huge data set of what is an average trauma, what is the pop in the population. And you can see that the average population has about 10% four or more races, where these cohort of these worst robbery offenders was 49%, so much, much higher. Um, and again, the first study, that, which is Bullock, um, Bullock is commissioned by the Violence Reduction Unit in London. She's part of the, um, Sadiq Khan's um, main objective of reducing violence in London. Their study was looking at what services were out there and was London equipped to deal with this trauma. And again, they had a good sample size of 15,431. Again, contacting everybody across London to look at what was the base mark of ACEs. And again, theirs was much lower. So, but what I wanted to know, not only did my group have four or more, but what was the level, what was the high harm in that group? And again, when I read it, it I was really surprised at the level of high harm and the level of victimisation and trauma that they had received. 63% of them had received, had witnessed domestic violence, but it wasn't just um, low-level domestic violence. We were having broken bones, serial perpetrator offenders. Again, psychological and emotional abuse, abuse. 91% of this cohort were known to children's services. They were serious um, levels of emotional abuse, serial levels of, of, of physical abuse. So that took me to... My findings were that these had disordered lives. Um, so I only looked at 81 of them, but they, they were responsible for 949 other offences that year. Now, the main offences they were responsible for were theft person, very similar to robbery. The second one was um, ABHDV, and lots of them were involved in dealing drugs. Um, now, it was no surprise that it's 80% of them used a knife for, to commit their robberies. My worst offender, M1, 
who had horrific um, childhood experience, um, ACEs, he had all of them. He committed all his robberies alone with a knife um, and randomly, but most of them were committed in groups of two or three. I thought the victimisation overlap was really high again. 80% of this cohort were victims first. So my, another really important, sorry, I had my 10 ACE categories I told you about, and then I looked at other traumas that they'd experienced. And this was another really high finding. 63% of them were regular missing persons. Um, M14, he committed or got accused of, taken to court, 40, um, he got accused of 14 robberies in 2019. But when I read his life, I knew from the beginning it wasn't going to end well. And I was really worried by the time I submitted my thesis, would he even be alive? This is the type of um, cross-cycle generational um, victimisation. So he had 300 reports. His mum and dad both had 300 over-reports on our systems. His grandma, his granddad was very well known to police. Grandma was a victim of serious domestic violence. Um, and... He was, and again, sexual abuse. His mum was a um, victim from her grandfather. This child then was a victim of sexual assault, not only by his own family, his stepfather, but the last arrest he was, he was accused of was sexually abusing his two-year-old brother, raping him in a children's home, videoing those um, to the rest of everybody else. And even more um, tragic, he's now been accused of murder. And he, uh, his. So it's, the victim offender went on through cycles. Um, really high amount of, of exclusion from school. We've got 49% of these children being excluded. And he himself left school at 12, his mother um, again at 14. They all had experienced psychological abuse and 54% of them were part of a gang, 27% in county lines. Again, the drug usage was a high harm. So we had six offenders who were actually um, six mums who were heroin dealers. Or, um, so we had a high proportion, not just of drug taking, but of drug use. Um, and 44% of this group also used drugs themselves. But again, the key finding to me was 91% of them. We knew about these children. It wasn't like we didn't know. They were known to social services. So we're coming back to why tackling violence is a key concern. We know it's important for police legitimacy. Tankerby talks about that. Reducing, obviously, street robbery is inherently part of the wider issue of lowering the level of serious violence and knife crime in London. I looked at literature of that victim-offender crossover, and I found a really good paper by um, Lewiston and Lorb in 2007 which was titled Understanding the Link Between Victimisation and Offending. But what I found really interesting is that they said that the police, governments, academics haven't learnt. We still treat people as either victims or we treat them as offenders. And there must be better crossovers of treating this group as victim offenders. And again, we've got some brilliant life course studies, but not enough of them. We've got Bottoms, um, Moffat... Um, I really, really um, enjoyed reading Farrington and Walsh's Stopping the Cycle of Offending book, which is in 2007, which I'd recommend. But again, we know about this. We know the predictors that will cause criminality, but what are we doing about it? Um, and there's plenty of ACE trot studies where, we, again, it's like, important that we key in early for early victimisation. I'm conscious of time, so I will push on. But... So what didn't I find? Well, first of all, this is a true positive. I was looking for ACEs in this group, and I definitely found it. And I didn't have the benefit of looking at all those children who had all those horrific things happen to them and didn't turn out to be offending. But what I did find was a link. Um, we only arrested 5% of them. Again, probably have missed some people in the group, but they were responsible for a high amount of crime. And it was incredibly time-consuming. I looked at 14,000 individual reports of their lifestyles because the police didn't um, track this very easy. 
Um, this is, I'll go through this very quickly, but there is definitely a cross, which we knew about before, of deprivation and, um, and ACEs. So the top one is where our robberies mainly occur in London, and the black symbol is Westminster. Again, we'd expect our crimes to have the highest robbery there. The, the ones in red are the borough of Southwark. Again, high amount of robberies occurring. And if you look on the left, um, the, there's again high amounts of ACE from the Asmussen study and a high amount of poverty. What I found there that these ACEs were in those poverty areas, not saying it doesn't happen in other homes, but that definitely was my findings. And the green is just a comparison really. Bromley Borough, which is the large one on the bottom, um, affluent, no ACEs, lots of money. Um, so what are the implications and the policy findings for the police? Well, if we really are serious about reducing violence, we need to start targeting and improving our input for these most vulnerable children. Again, silo working was really interesting. When we children move from children's home to children's home, often we weren't sharing that information about. Um, if we were finding children on a bus with somebody else on a stop and search, there was no intel on that other child, and often we'd find things about their lives going backwards. We need to have that real public health approach. We need to be putting in as an organisation our Merlin reports to track their lives um, and have much better. We talk about public health approach and, um, and it is that link with the College of Policing and our senior leads to start saying, well, how can we target? How can we track and get in these lives much, much earlier? And I'm talking as well to our head of robbery unit about how we can operate in a more trauma-informed way. Thank you very much for listening. Um, my name is Sara Valdevenito and I work in the Institute of Criminology. And um, during the last year, Professor Sherman and I started an alliance for working with forecasting arrests for serious violence among probationers in London. And you are probably wondering, well, this is a conference on police and police data. Why are we going to talk about probationers? Well, I have a little surprise. We have used in this analysis data from the police. Actually, most of the information for the predictions here are based in the police national computer system. So just to give you a little bit of context, everything here in this piece of research is about integrating police and probation records for better offender management in the community. As you may know, probation officers use a variety of risk assessment methods to define the characteristics and intensity of the supervisions in the community. So low risk offenders are not going to get most of the resources from the probation service. But in the opposite case, high risk offenders should concentrate a lot more resources and probably the intensity of the supervision should be higher. In England and Wales, these assessments for probationers are rarely adjust to new arrest data or arrests that happen during the probation supervision period. And the reason why this data hasn't been used so often so far is because there are some kind of legal impediments and difficulties to merge these two sources of data. So at the end of last year, we were very lucky because one of these companies that um, provide probation for low risk offenders share with us some information that we use for forecasting. So this is our data. First of all, we got around 12,000 cases from the probation service in London. These offenders started their probation in 2015, and we had so many cases for two years. So we use this data as the base for our forecasting. We basically want to know if offenders in probation are going to, how likely are those offenders of committing a serious harm crime or a serious crime offense? So that was the first source of data. 
And then we add, we merge this data set with PNC data, Police National Computer System Records. The police share with us the 33,000 arrests so far, a little bit more than that, arrest event. So we had from one side individuals in probation and events of arrest in the police records. And we try to merge this data together. So as you can imagine, not all offenders had records, but many of them had quite a lot of records of arrests before and after. After merging these two sources of data, we ended up with around 10,000 cases that we used for forecasting. Some characteristics of the sample. Well, as it often happened with offenders, most of them are male. They were around 34 years old. Uh, I have to say that ladies were slightly older than men, but the difference is not huge. 33% of them were in custody before probation, and a large majority was in the community before starting probation. Um, many of them had previous probation orders, on average five at least, and this is an interesting point, less than 1% was predicted to be at high risk of reoffending. So out of these 9,000 something offenders, less than 1% was predicted to commit or be arrested for a new high harm offense in the future. This is also relevant. We observe in the data that on average, this sample had one arrest before the current probation order and five arrests during the current probation order. So graphically, you can see on the slide that the bulk of the information or the bulk of the arrests that we got from the PNC data happened during the probation supervision. So when the probation officers are missing this information, they are missing an important part of the picture. What kind of crimes did we observe in this sample, this bulk of information here? Where Many different types of crime, but the majority were drugs, assault, or robbery, thefts, related offenses. We also found very serious crime, crimes as murder or murder-related crimes. So once we got all this data in the figure before, we tried to split these cases into subgroups. The first one, we called them high-risk harm, and the other was low harm. Uh, in the set, in the group of the high harm, we included uh, offenses such as robbery, rape, murder, bodily harm, grievous bodily harm. And the low harm group was the group of those offenders with no offense during the 12 months during probation or no high harm offense during the same period, during these 365 days. So we found 11% of high harm offenders using this, this definition. Uh, that was around 1,000 high harm offenders. And we tried to predict how likely it was going to be for this group to commit another high harm crime. So here, and this is one of the main things with predictions and forecasting, we are trying to forecast the minority because those are the ones we really care for, right? The power of the few, the felonious few. And running predictions for these small groups, it's not something, something simply, simple. Even machines struggle with these kind of predictions. But there are some alternatives that we can use to deal with this imbalance in our data. So basically, I'm not going to go into details, but we use random forest, as Geoffrey did before. But we try to calibrate this model for predicting this minority group, the felonious few. So the random forest works as 
thousands of brains trying to combine data. Years ago, I worked as a probation officer, and I remember that based on the cases I knew, I could say, well, this guy is probably quite high risk. The problem with that is that my brain can keep a number, a, lim a limited number of cases and information, whereas the machine, as in the case of an algorithm, can deal with thousands, probably millions of combinations to make decisions about the forecasting of an offender. So it works uh, based on the wisdom of the majority. And algorithms, as you know, report the overall accuracy of the forecasting model, error, predictors' importance, and the well-known false positives and false negatives. So another element for the uh, prediction model is uh, trying to define some elements. I'm not going to read this, but I can explain to you, based on this figure, that we split data into before and after. So the yellow point in the middle is the date when the offenders started probation, the disposal date. So this is day zero. And then we predicted what, go, what was going to happen using data during 12 months, the first 12 months under probation. Everything else was used as predictors because the causes should be before the, um, the effect. So that was more or less how we organized the model. So we are aimed to predict high harm during the first 12 months in probation. These are the variables that we use as predictors. Age at the current probation, number of previous probation orders, how many times the person was in probation before, the type of offense, number of arrests before, disposal date, gender, number of arrests for serious offenses, so the ones we defined, and start from prison, if the offender started from prison or if the offender was in the community at the moment to start probation. The most important predictors in the model are the first three, age at the current probation, number of previous orders, and type of offense. So the random forest gave us some details about the best predictors in this analysis. And we came up with this, which is a confusion matrix. Um, not easy to explain, but you are a specialized and, and specialized audience. So I think you are quite familiar with these tables and false positives and false negatives. So overall, the random forest did well or was accurate 60, 76 percent of the times. It's not ideal, it's not perfect, but it means in small numbers four out of five. But as you may know, the way to judge an algorithm, it's not the overall accuracy. Sometimes the overall accuracy can be biased. So it is important to have a look of the false negatives, those cases where the mother predicted high harm uh, sorry, when the, where the model predicted low harm, but actually the cases were high harm. So if you see here, the red boxes are the times when the model made a mistake, and the green are those times when the random forest was successful. So we have one, three false positives per each false negative. Doesn't sound bad, but if you look then, true positives, true negatives, and the percentages, we have some issues, right? Um, here, we only have 9%. So still, it seems that the machine learned something from the data we presented. But we needed to compare this with business as usual, because that's the fair comparison. And this was the prediction based on probation officers. So you are probably thinking, well, this model is much better than the random forest, they were accurate 89% uh, of the times. And when I got these results, actually I had that impression. Well, the random forest is not really working. It seems that probation officers are doing better. The problem with this model is that if we keep trapped in the overall accuracy, we are missing part of the information. 
As you can see here, the officers, the probation officers using uh, OASIS, play quite safe. Almost all of them were true negatives or low harm offenders. And the prediction was very small in terms of high risk. So over 9,000, only 1% was predicted as a high harm. It was quite safe, right, compared with the previous one. Here, 900 is around 20% of 3,911. So it seems that all these conclusions here are driven by the fact that the risk assessment by human beings are kind of safe playing. It's uh, like sitting on the fence, right? Almost all of them are predicted to be low risk. So this is all quite confusing. And when things are confusing, I try to go to the basics. So once we had a look at this data, we started thinking, well, but what is the important thing here? And the important thing is the power of the few, right? How many times the model can predict correctly who is going to be a high harm offender? So we came out with this information here. This is sensitivity and specificity, two complicated concepts. But basically, in the first case, sensitivity, we try to check how many times the model can accurately identify in the actual data those high harm offenders. The random forest detected 41% of the high risk offenders and the probation officers only detected 5% of them. When it comes to specificity, we are trying to test how accurate is the model for detecting the true positives. So the random forest did it better than, uh, sorry, the probation officers did it better than the random forest because they play safe, right? Most of, the, most of the offenders were predicted to be low or moderate risk. So the random forest wasn't as successful, but in balance, we are mostly interested in the high harm group. And for the high harm group, the random forest is doing better, is taking more risk and at the same time being more precise. I think I'm running out of time, but I want to share just a last idea. Uh, many times algorithms have been criticized because they are biased by one variable that is introduced in the model quite often, which is race or ethnicity. In this model, we exclude ethnicity or race from the model. We didn't use this as a predictor. So we took that risk. Okay, this is controversial, let's take it out of the model. But once we have produced the forecasting, we wanted to check if there was some kind of racial bias in the predictions. If black people, for instance, or those who reported black as an ethnicity were overrepresented in the error or in the positive cases. So this is what we found. When it comes to the true positive rates by race, we can see that the proportion of predictions is mostly the same. This is only for high risk offenders. When we check the false positives by race, Again, numbers are not that different, although uh, there is a slightly higher proportion of cases in the group that declare race as white. So it seems that at least based on this sample and these data, there is no racial disparities and maybe we can get rid of um, this information for running a forecasting model. Um, I think, as a conclusion, I've arrived to two basic points. Does it mean that we have to use random forest? Well, I'm not pretty sure yet. We need more information. We run this model with 9,000 cases. There are so many more cases of probation in London 
And we would like to have access to that information and also have access to the police records and combine that information for producing forecastings that can allow probation officers supervise offenders in the community with better quality data. So I don't know if random forest is the best tool, but I wouldn't ignore these results. First, it seems that the machine it's not get not confused or it's not scared of identifying high risk and it does it quite well. If one of the critics on algorithms is racial bias, it seems based on this information that is not the case. So I'm not sure if we should use algorithm yet, but I'm pretty sure that we should keep trying, we should keep exploring this combination of data. And I'm pretty sure of another thing here, and is that when probation service is ignored or it's not aware of the data collected by the police, it's missing a big part of the picture. And I think we have a lot of things to do here. Um, apparently, we are going to get some more data, and if that is the case, I hope to be here next year and share the bad or the good news, maybe. Who knows? Thank you. Okay, so we've got four speakers in this particular part of the conference, uh, and they come from across the country. So we've got a north-south divide. We've got uh, individuals representing Lancashire, Surrey, the Met, and Durham and Cleveland, I'm going to say, um, because there was movement in between uh, now and uh, when... Uh, the thesis was done. This particular section is entitled Protecting Domestic Abuse Victims. And in true policing and Cambridge style, we won't necessarily talk about that in that particular context, but it will have a theme running through it about protecting victims. It's also got one of learning and how potentially conducting a thesis can be um, something of a learning experience in itself, no matter what your thesis uh, results in. Um, but the most important thing is about the learning and the protecting of individuals, and whether you're numbers-led or values-led in terms of protecting vulnerability. I think those at Cambridge fully understand that if we can protect the most vulnerable, we've done a fair amount of our work uh, within policing. So Andy Jenkins is going to talk to you about voluntary attendance and arrest um, in relation to domestic abuse. Sharon will talk to you about protecting domestic abuse victims. Uh, John will talk about his learning process of his thesis, which, which was to do with IDVAs. And Elisa will talk about the vulnerability and harm in relation to child exploitation. So without further ado, can I invite, please, uh, Andy to come and give his particular presentation. Thanks, Andy. Uh, my name's Andy Jenkins. I'm a detective inspector with Surrey Police. And uh, this presentation is going to focus on my research aimed at improving crime investigation outcomes or positive outcomes as we normally refer to them. Um, and reducing recidivism in violent and sexual offences um, using two common components of our investigations, um, voluntary attendance and arrest. So the main research question um, for my research was do suspects arrested in cases of violent or sexual offences, both in domestic abuse and non-domestic abuse, um, have different prevalence rates of positive outcomes or recidivism from suspects asked to attend a police station voluntarily. Um, important to point out at this point that the definition for violence is as per the Home Office uh, notifiable offences list. Um, that includes violence with and without injury. Um, so it does include things like physical assaults, but also includes things like harassment and child cruelty. And the domestic abuse in the study is intimate and non-intimate domestic abuse. So why do we actually want to look at this kind of thing? So five main reasons, certainly in Surrey, that we wanted to look at this. Uh, the first and probably really important one is demand. Um, between 
2015, 2019, um, that this data covers, there was an increase in the number of offences reported to um, the police. 79% increase in non-DA violence. Uh, putting that in figures, that goes from 13,000 offences a year to over 23,000 offences that we're investigating every year. 37% increase in DA violence and a 30% increase in serious sexual offences. 1,300 up to 1,700 offences of rape and serious sexual offences that we were investigating. And this is against the backdrop where we haven't got an investment in the officers. We haven't got our up, uplift by this point. And at the same time, our ability to actually detect the offences was falling. Um, you can see those figures there, quite stark. Um, solve rate or positive outcome rate for non-DA violence fell from 31% to 15%. DA violence from 28 to 13 and serious sexual 18 to 4%. These are quite eye-watering um, outcome rates for any police force. Um, but not uncommon across the country. But also important was our outcome 16 um, use, which for those who don't know is where the victim withdraws their support for the investigation. Now in, in DA cases, 44% of our unsolved cases in 2015 were filed as outcome 16, and that rose to a massive 60% by 2019. Uh, Non-DA remained pretty stable at 25%, and serious and sexual in 2015, it was 25%. That rose as well, 36% of our filed crimes. Cost, really important as well. Um, average seven-hour stay in, in our custody cost the force £263. Um, the average two-hour voluntary attendance was only £42. So if we can say that voluntary attendance is just as good as the rest, that's going to have a massive impact on, on a budget. So it's quite a small force. Um, but our budget for custody is five and a half million pounds a year. So if we can take a big chunk out of that, that's going to have a, a big impact on us as a force. But victim satisfaction, uh, so important in DA and serious sexual offences. Um, as we know, their cooperation and support results in better longer term outcomes. So we've got to do something to reverse these figures. So how do we do it? Well, that's the first question I asked my supervisor, uh, Matt Bland, um, when I turn up with a very large spreadsheet of data. He says, make a pivot table. Um, and I'm like, what? So off I go and learn how to use Excel properly. But in all seriousness, um, 140,075 crime reports over that five year period, uh, just over 35,000 domestic abuse violence crimes, 96,500 non-DA violence crimes, and 8,000 rapes and serious sexual assault um, offenses. We were looking at a natural experiment and how we did this. So we were looking at the natural predisposition of officers um, to using arrest or voluntary attendance. That's important because we want to look at the independent selection of the jobs that they were assigned, the independent choice by those officers when they turn up as to whether they use an arrest or VA in certain circumstances. But looking at that natural predisposition helps us understand what would be the case if we told the officers what to do in the majority of cases and try and apply that to our um, policy implications. So what do we find? <clears throat> so the first look at positive outcomes, so our, our solve rate. Um, the orange bars is non-DA violence, and we see that more crimes are solved when an officer predisposes to arrest. So that's predisposition is more than 75% of their cases, compared to if they don't predispose or if they predispose to using VA. And the same is seen in DA violence, which is the blue bars, where predisposition to arrest results in a higher positive outcome rate or solve rate for the police. But serious sexual offences see an opposite effect, where predisposition to VA, or voluntary attendance, um, sees more cases solved. And this is interesting, but requires much more investigation, because we need to look at whether factors such as the timeliness of the, those particular types of investigations or whether they're recent or non-recent have an impact on that. But there's two other quite important considerations in this, in this set. When we take out the predisposition by the officers, the positive outcome rates are always better when we arrest compared to when we VA. I'll come back to that later. And the second one, the use of both arrest and VA is always provides 
higher positive outcome rates than doing neither. And you're probably saying, well, that's common sense. Why are you telling us the obvious? But for years, we've actually been filing investigations at source when they come into the force before they're allocated to try and compete with demand. And we wonder why our positive outcome rates are so small when we're not even allocating them to be dealt with. So what about recidivism? So within all three crime types, recidivism is lowest where the suspect is dealt with by an officer who predisposes to arrest. Uh, that's seen within, within crime types, for example, where a DA offender commits a further DA crime, um, and that's seen in the first three columns. Um, but it's also seen across crime types, for example, where a DA offender commits a sexual offence, which you can see in the fourth column there. So what is this actually telling us? Arrest is a deterrent. So it's something we already know, but this is reaffirming that within our data. But we know that our victims are probably the most important part of our investigation. So how does the way we deal with our suspects actually affect our victims? So the use of outcome 16, as I said earlier, is the victim withdrawing support for the investigation and where we close it unsolved was higher in, in cases, higher overall in cases where the suspect was arrested. That's the 42.8% there. Compared to when VA was used, 26.1% of our unsolved crimes, we used outcome 16. And then the second section, it shows our use of outcome 16 was disproportionately used in our DA offences. 54.3% um, of our unsolved crimes were filed as outcome 16 compared to 26% in our non-DA violence and 31.1% in our serious sexual. Now this suggests to us that DA victims especially don't like the use of arrest, but we've already said that arrest is a deterrent and it's a good thing. But of note was that recidivism was also higher in those cases where we used outcome 16. Um, There's a bit of a surprise in, in the data. So we're saying it's bad, that outcome 16 is bad for victim satisfaction, but it's also putting them at, 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 at increased risk of being a repeat victim. So this highlights just how complex dealing with DA is. We've got competing demands now. So what does this actually mean for us as the police? So non-DA violence, predisposition to arrest leads to reduced recidivism and higher positive outcomes. In serious sexual offences, predisposition to arrest results in re reduced recidivism. And given the seriousness of these offences, preventing those further offences should be the priority over us and our solve rate. So what we should be saying to our officers is there's clear support for arrest in the majority of cases and actually support them using it. And also be clear that filing instead of allocating just sets us up to fail, ourselves and our victims. And in DA violence, predisposition to arrest reduces recidivism and is more likely to result in a positive outcome. And we solve the crime. But we know that outcome 16 use is highest after arrest and furthermore is highest in those DA cases. Recidivism is higher in outcome 16 cases compared to <clears throat> excuse me, other unsolved outcomes. But also within the data, we found that the vast majority of our offenders don't actually re-offend. So 94% of our offenders are not re-offended. So nothing hugely new there, but is it now time to start thinking about doing things differently? If the arrest is still the preferred outcome because we know it's the best deterrent against future offending, is there another part of the investigation process that we can change to maintain that benefit? So we've still got some further work to be carried out, but this is where we start linking in with other pieces of research that have been going on um, and thinking about alternative outcomes, such as community resolutions, checkpoint, diversion, conditional cautions, which may, <clears throat> may provide the possibility to reduce our outcome 16 use, reduce recidivism, reduce 
future crime harm against victims and arguably can maintain suspect engagement, less demand on our courts and a more positive and more efficient outcome for the force. So in summary, um, this study has presented us with a renewed opportunity to look at how we investigate and prosecute DA and support victims um, throughout the life of the investigation and then prevent further offences. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sharon Cadell. Um, and as uh, Debbie alluded to, I am from Durham Constabulary, but by virtue of a complicated arrangement, I am also from Cleveland Police as well. So, my thesis was on um, a comparative analysis of domestic abuse, crime harm values and dash risk assessment grades um, in Durham over a four-year period. And I'm sure you all know these, these acronyms coming from the policing world, but I will be using DASH for um, domestic abuse, stalking, harassment, farm, URN for unique reference number, MARAC, multi-agency risk assessment conference, and so on. Just to take you through a bit of a roadmap for the presentation this morning, then I will be doing, take, giving you a look at the research question that I developed. Um, showing you the early findings that came out um, of the analytical work that I did with Matt Bland. Um, just taking you through some of the data and methodology and some of the techniques that we used as well. And then focusing on the so what factors, the policy implications. And I'll just be finishing up with some of the outcomes and the recommend recommendations that have been made to the force with a view to operationalising the findings from the thesis. So, um, just by way of background, I have a long term interest in domestic abuse and I saw the degree as an opportunity to help Durham enhance its victim-focused approach as well. And from having done the first year of the, the, the master's course, I was really interested in this concept of crime harm and curious to understand how that related to um, domestic abuse risk measurements through the DASH risk assessment farm as well. So I developed, um, with Professor Sherman's help, this research question, to what extent does the crime harm index ranking and dash grading of domestic abuse victims in Durham change year on year over a four year period? And that was between 2016 and 2020. And I was keen to understand what the relationship was between those two very different metrics as well. And to give the research some breadth and depth, I developed a series of sub questions as well. So um, I wanted to know where the dash was um, providing an accurate assessment of the actual harm suffered by victims, um, whether it was reliable in terms of recidivism, um, uh, predicting recidivism rather, um, and things like was the orthodoxy of repeat victimisation and escalation right? Um, and I was interested in this idea of the power few as well and, and whether analysis might reveal that there was indeed this group that we really should be kind of focus, focusing our resources towards. So these were some of the findings and the, um, the table on the, the left side of this slide here um, shows you first of all um, that I had done some mapping um, of harm against uh, high harm um, against high risk. And I should just mention that high harm was given something of an arbitrary definition of over 100 sentencing days. Um, but that was that was a helpful kind of metric to use um, against the high risk dash. And the results for themselves are set out in that table. And of course, when we did the comparison there, you can see on that bottom row that in all of the years examined, um, there was just over an average of over 20% match between high harm, actual high harmed victims and those high risk um, graded dash forms as well, um, which was quite, quite a concerning finding. Um, just sanity checking this, this idea of kind of 
um, escalation and so on as well, and found that 48% of high-risk graded victims, there was no reappearance with those as well. Um, and in fact, um, from the, the year one, found that only 2.4% of victims reappeared in, in, in all of the years as well. Um, so that, that sort of distills it down to quite, quite a small fraction. Um, then when went further with the analysis and, and looked at kind of distribution of harm and I had quite a big data set and chunked that up into 10 equal subsections called deciles. Um, did some analysis around that in terms of harm and found, and th this is, is uh, articulated in this, this, uh, this pie chart that you see on screen there, that the top decile was associated with the vast majority of harm, 93%. Um, and I did further analysis around that as well and looked at kind of the distribution of harm across the whole of the four-year period as well and found that 5.2% of all victims were associated, again, with the vast majority of harm, 87%. Um, so, data. What data did I use to, to arrive at these findings then? I started off with a huge and quite overwhelming data set, 46,721 crime records from kindly uh, provided to me from Durham Constabulary. I asked for things like dates of crime so that I can, could, could kind of sense check um, victims who were re reappearing and so on. Home office codes, subcodes and descriptors so that I could apply the crime harm index scores. Victim URNs so that I could distill out of those crimes how many individual victims there were and found just over, just less than 21,000 there. Um, dash forms, very important for the comparative analysis that I was doing, so there was just over 40,000 of those. Um, quite important in terms of the comparison that I could match the, the dashes to the crime and did that using the victim URN. And that distilled it down to this figure of 15,266. Um, I did some of the counts as well, um, using the, 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 the handy instructions on pivot tables provided by uh, Dr. Matt Bland there, um, and found that we had had, over that four-year period, um, 3,279 Marac interventions, but actually when we looked at the harm, how many of those were actual high-harmed victims, there was just over 2,000 there. So. Um, in terms of methodology then, um, I think just, you know, this, this was all very sensitive data and I was really keen to do no harm, so anonymised it and so on. Um, and once I'd, I'd kind of, you know, locked that data down um, and I could then apply sort of the, the lens of the crime harm index, I had developed a hypothesis um, which was helpful in terms of getting me to, towards um, my findings. And my hypothesis was that high harm really should be linked to high risk. Um, I was also keen to understand where the resource intensive interventions like MARAC were being used for the highest harm cases as well. Um, so I my, my methodology involved rank ordering, kind of all this work with crime harm values as well, um, analysing harm levels in each year as well, with a view to identifying that, that kind of that small cohort, that power few. So, um, I did a quantitative um, data study only in terms of research design. I didn't do mixed methods and I will mention some limitations early on here. Um, I only used reported recorded crimes and of course we know in domestic abuse because, because victims commonly say this that they don't always report their crimes and we know that not every incident is crimed as well. So it's entirely feasible, I may be missing a big chunk of information here but nevertheless what I did have, I was quite confident that that data had credibility and integrity and was, was really solid in terms of being used for analytical purposes. Um, I did have to do quite a lot of cleansing. There had been a change, for instance, in the counting rules for stalking and harassment back in 2019, so I had to remove all of those records. 
and also removed all of those crimes without dashes as well. Um, and as I say, that, that was quite helpful in getting that figure from 46,000 down to 15,000. Um, in terms of analytical methods then, I, um, I used conditional probability um, and it's still something I struggle to, to explain, but it was really um, the central in terms of kind of my thesis findings. Um, I basically understand it as finding the likelihood of event A, given that event B has already occurred, um, and was able to apply that in terms of um, kind of, you know, this link between high risk and, and high harm. Um, I also used rank ordering, percentage cap calculations, and then, as I say, kind of, you know, establishing these harm bandings and these deciles as well. Um, all of this was taking us towards um, the policy implications, the so what, why, why does this matter? Um, because all of this has to mean something in policing, doesn't it? You know, it has to land. What value does it offer? Has it got public interest or not? Um, and for me, this was very much around targeting very limited resources. We all know that, that policing has faced a period uh, of austerity, um, you know, and, and that is likely to be compounded in future, whether that's kind of efficient efficiency measures or whatever, or the rise of kind of complex crime types. Um, it, it's highly likely to get more difficult. And so we needed to be able to understand how we could optimise our resources um, as far as possible. So the policy implications were this adds to that bulk of knowledge already out there um, in terms of, of understanding domestic abuse victimisation. But for me particularly, it was around do we, do we have confidence in the tools that we use? Are they able to, to reliably assess and, and predict and prevent domestic abuse as well? Um, some of the things that fell out of this were that initial engagement with victims as well. Um, so what happens at that first point of contact, improving officer awareness of domestic abuse. And interestingly, and I, I kind of hark back to my original interest, was this, this kind of idea of could we use that harm dimension in that initial risk assessment in order to triage, in order to target better as well. Because I come from PCC world, um, PCCs, as, as you will all know, have quite a considerable sort of locus of control within policing these days. They have this governance role, they are responsible for the resourcing as well, holding to account and so on, and determining the strategic priorities and direction as well. And for me, this, you know, this piece of work wasn't just relevant to the constabulary, it was absolutely relevant to the, the PCC office. Um, in Durham and, and elsewhere. Um, I have shared it with, with Cleveland as well. Um, domestic abuse, it's still, um, and rightly so, very high priority um, on the national agenda. Um, absolutely likely to feature in, in many of the police and crime plans that are currently being developed as well. So, you know, I, I see this, this piece of research as absolutely locking in with that as well. Um, Excellence in victim care was strategic priority for Chief Constable Jo Farrell as well, and she was highly supportive of this piece of research, and I continue to meet with, with uh, Chief Constable Farrell as well, um, and, and um, the, the DCC and ACC up there in terms of, of progressing this piece of work, um, it, and essentially de delivering those police ob policing objectives of prevention of harm, early intervention, and victim restoration. Critically, I think this piece of work provides the constabulary with an evidence base to target its resources to more, more effectively to the highest harmed and to modify and improve its policies and processes as well. And I'll just finish on the operationalisation piece here. So these key outcomes and recommendations that I'm now discussing um, with, with the force. Um, clearly, there's a mismatch between high harm domestic abuse and the use of support resources such as MARAC. I did do some financial analysis around this as well and had harm been used um, in, in terms of, of kind of um, determining who would go to MARAC, um, 
the cost of that would have been just under £3,000, as opposed to using DASH, which um, brought the cost up to about um, £450,000. So there was a potential saving there of, of around about £150,000. Um, so there are potential financial benefits of targeting domestic abuse harm as well. And, and in the force, like others, very interested in efficiency and effectiveness always, um, really interested in this as well. Um, so other recommendations that I have made are around incorporating this harm measure into, um, into DASH initial assessments somehow. Um, domestic abuse training to officers around optimising that initial victim contact. Um, you know, whether that, that is in pursuit of criminal justice outcomes, actually, it's, it's also about kind of getting good victim support in place as well. Um, that might be um, the, you know, if my data is right, that might be the only contact that they have with the, with the constabulary um, over a, a few years. So it's, it's quite important to make the absolute best of it. And then, um, you know, thinking on to the kind of criminal justice outcomes as well. This is absolutely about kind of making best use of the technology that's present there, things like body-worn cameras and so on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Ross. I'm going to present a slightly different take uh, for uh, my thesis journey. I'm going to explain the context that I was operating in and how I came to the decision to choose what I did for my thesis. Uh, talk a bit about my thesis and the findings. Uh, but I'll also then talk about the lessons learnt and things that might have been useful to know at the beginning that I didn't know until the end. So the operational context for me was um, in the Metropolitan Police in 2019, I had strategic lead responsibility for domestic abuse. And in the previous year, we'd had 144,000 domestic abuse incidents and 85,000 domestic abuse crimes. The Met had recently restructured and moved to a BCU operating model and we were experiencing challenges in containing the sheer volume of domestic abuse demand. And at one point, our detection rate for domestic abuse fell below 10%. There was a strong desire from chief officers to have a, a good DA focus, but my challenge was, well, in the context of rising fatal street violence for London, what should that look like? Um, senior officers were focusing on two things predominantly from a domestic abuse perspective. The first was response times, the challenge of how can we be quicker to respond to burglary than to domestic abuse and what does that say about our culture. And arrest rates, 40% uh, at one point uh, for arrest in a crime type where we know the identity of the suspect most of the time and have a responsibility to deliver positive action. So, for me and my team, this was quite intellectually challenging. Uh, does a speedy response mean that we uh, are effective at our action at the scene? And does arrest improve things? And if so, how? So I wanted to take opportunity to develop a more sophisticated evaluation framework for the future of DA in London, one that focuses upon the activities or outcomes that we know make a difference. And I'm a believer in what gets measured gets done. And I wanted to ensure that we invested in tracking the right things. But the question for us really was, what does success really look like? We consulted and shaped a four-point evaluation framework with our, with our partners that comprises of CJ effectiveness, which means convictions, what I would call the end game, rather than, the, rather than arrest or detection, maybe a half-time score. And remember what Rachel Tuffin said yesterday about the national appetite now for CJ effectiveness to be a priority. The second was repeat victimisation by volume. The third is repeat victimisation by harm, recognising that not all crime is equal. And the fourth is victim satisfaction. So we would have a quantitative as well as a qualitative uh, framework. So our strategy had a very overt section of what works. And we had quite a, an extensive list of things that we wanted to apply this methodology to internally, but also externally. So we wanted to look at things like, does arrest work, the use of bail and RUI, DVPNs and Claire's Law. Uh, but externally, we wanted to look at the, um, the impact of uh, specialist domestic abuse courts, the roles of IDVAs at court, and audible alarms. <coughs> 
So from a thesis point of view, I was sport for choice. Um, and I think with hindsight, I was a bit excitable and uh, perhaps a bit naive. And um, certainly with the help of my uh, in, in force mentor and supervisors, I needed a bit of a reality check of what could be achieved. And it was really important that whilst I had the value that the work needed to add value to the workplace, uh, by the end of it, that we needed clarity that this was a master's program and not a PhD program, and uh, what I took on needed to be achievable. And it was interesting yesterday that, that Neil Basu made the point about there's little value in learning lessons that you can't implement. And I think that's a really, uh, a really uh, important point. But right under my nose was an opportunity where, in London, we have one specialist domestic abuse court that has operated for many, many years. And on a Monday and a Tuesday, an IDVA is present to support victims, but on a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday, it's not. Um, and so uh, that became the, the focus of my thesis. So my methodology was to take the court data for 2018 and divide it into two groups, the days when an IDVA was present and, and it, uh, days when the IDVA was not and to research all of the victims in that period for the 18-month period post their trial date to identify their repeat victimisation. And then to compare the data against three of the four points that were the framework that we'd agreed as an organisation we would take on and had agreement with MOPAC would be the framework for London across statutory partners. So CJ effectiveness, repeat victimisation by volume and by harm. I initially applied the analysis to all DA but later divided that into uh, two groups, intimate partner DA and familial abuse, recognising that actually they're quite different. And the familial abuse group comprised of 15% of my sample. And as analysis became finer and finer and, and distilled it down into groups, that, that, that group of, of, of abuse became very quickly too small to apply analysis to. So the findings for my, for my thesis are presented predominantly from intimate partner perspective. Because my approach uh, included a comparison group, it's considered more valuable than a simple before or af and after uh, analysis. And the circumstances that I investigated was considered a natural or quasi-experiment. In life, we're conditioned to believe in certain preconceptions. And in a DA context, one certainly for me is that IDVAs add value and it's better for a victim to be supported by one than not. And as I began the, the research, I expected that the outcome would be that I would be able to evidence that point which would support us as a, as a collection of agencies in London to support commissioning decisions for uh, specialist domestic abuse courts to become more prevalent across London to support victims of domestic abuse. So what did I find? So the first is that compared to the non-IDVA group, the IDVA group trials had a 12% reduction in the risk of a conviction, which is a statistically significant finding. So this is really quite interesting, and as has been, been uh, a term that was used to me, is that it defies logic. Um, it's not what we expect the outcome to be. So the, the analysis uh, is presented as a relative risk ratio, which, um, I hope I get this right, in simple terms, identifies the risk of an event happening in one group and the risk of that event happening in the second group and dividing one by the other so you get a result that compares the two groups. And in this instance, the difference in the risk is 12%. So in kind of layman's terms, the IDVA group achieve fewer um, uh, convictions at court than the non-IDVA group. The second is that compared to the non-IDVA group, the IDVA group trials had a 96% increased risk of repeat victimisation of a domestic abuse incident in the 18 months post-trial. And that's really uh, quite stark, I think. And the third, the IDVA group trials had a mean CCHI score of 80 days imprisonment for repeat victimisation offences compared to a mean CCHI score of 10 days for the non-IDVA group. So an 800% more harmful group uh, uh, for the IDVAs. So what? So the government introduced in 2005 a package of measures with the, with the clear focus of, in, of improving CJ effectiveness. And two key 
parts of that, of that strategy was the introduction of a specialist domestic abuse court and the introduction of IDVAs at court. And bear in mind that this piece of work is only about IDVAs in the court setting at that court for this period of time. It's not about the IDVA service generally. And so the so what from, from my research is that at that court, for that period of time, that isn't being achieved. And arguably, the opposite is being achieved. What's really interesting for me is the question of what should the IDVA framework for evaluation look like? Um, uh, quite a lot of, 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 of uh, literature exists in relation to this. And there's a view that because IDVA services are commissioned on short-term funding arrangements, actually they don't have the, the, cap the capacity and certainly the, the longevity of data to be able to, to do evaluation that is anything more than an initial victim satisfaction. So IDVA services tend to be evaluated as a victim satisfaction score uh, rather than uh, from a, a data point of view. So I'm really conscious that I've applied a, an evaluation framework to the IDVA service at this court that isn't what they get measured by um, in, within their funding arrangements. But having done this work, I feel really quite clear that, that there's an opportunity for the, eva the evaluation framework to be quantitative as well as qualitative. From a policing context, this arrangement at this court hinders CJ effectiveness and increases repeat victimisation. So our challenge is how to open the conversation given it's not, it's not a service that we have direct responsibility for. But I would also want that conversation to include discussion of whether we aspire to keep victims safe, which is one of the terms that is used uh, for the IDVA service nationally by Safe Lives who, who operate it on behalf of the Home Office, or safer. And for me, that's the difference between repeat victimisation by volume and repeat victimisation by harm. And I've had lots of conversations with professionals about this since these findings have started to emerge from my research. And it's really quite a, uh, an, an interesting landscape to consider the two words safe or safer. For me, domestic abuse is really quite a complex area of business. It, it deals with power and control in, in, in intimate relationships. And um, the question for me is, is it realistic for any agency to have an intervention that makes us think that as of, as of, as of the point of that intervention, that that victim is now safe? Or do we have the opportunity to, to look at it differently and say, actually, we, 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 we aspire for the intervention to, to mean that that victim is safer, albeit it hasn't stopped? And a conversation with Anivra about this piece of work was, well, actually, the only way that the victim is safe is if the victim leaves that relationship. But we know from other research that leaving and breaking the domestic abuse relationship is one of the most dangerous points from a homicide perspective. So it's really tricky to have a strategy that, that is built for me on the word safe, which naturally means breaking the relationship if that potentially creates more danger for victims. So I think there's, there's a, a, a real conversation to be had about that. So let's move on to what I learned. The first is that my 2018 sample size wasn't big enough. Um, and so I expanded it to 2016 and to 2017. And my final sample was of 559 trials. The second is unit of analysis. You need to be really clear about what it is that your unit of analysis is. And if I'm honest, up until probably quite recently, I wasn't. Um, in, in my case, my unit of analysis predominantly is trials. But it's really easy to, to start thinking and presenting the results as victims rather than, and, and people rather than events. And it makes a difference to the, to the, to the, um, it makes a difference to, to the results that you're presenting. Um, and, and, and I, with hindsight, I struggle to get my head around that. And it's really important that, that we do. Um, the next is to record every decision that you make in relation to your data and your thesis, your research along the way. Um, because at some point you might need to backtrack and understand why this thing was or wasn't included and the impact uh, that it has later on. I would highly recommend that you do your analysis yourself. Uh, a bit daunting. Um, I, I felt that I was a data type of person. I felt that I was quite, um, quite good with spreadsheets. Um, I learned that there was a lot more to learn. Um, but I wanted to take on the, the data analysis myself. I certainly needed support from, from our stats advisors. But uh, uh, now that I'm at the end of it, I've learned so much about how to do it 
uh, I would encourage you to, to try to take on the analysis yourself. I think it's quite tricky to stand in this position to talk about the uh, analysis findings if you haven't actually had hands-on the mechanics of, of, of how those results were achieved. What I didn't expect was quite how poor data quality is. I think I would describe it at best it's poor and sometimes it's worse. Um, one of the exercises I needed to do with my data was to, to match um, uh, uh, victims and witnesses. Uh, the victim's task was quite tricky. Sorry, not victims, but victims and suspects. The victim's uh, was quite tricky, but was achieved. The suspects, there simply wasn't enough data in the system to be able to identify that this suspect on this line is the same as this suspect on that line. And that really hindered uh, the opportunity to, to present different and, and further results in, in my work. The next is um, whether this is a, an easier thesis uh, and research project than an RCT. And having been around some colleagues who are doing an RCT, I'm not so sure that it is. I, I would just describe it as different. Uh, my work involved a huge amount of data mining, data cleansing, and coding and analysis. Um, many, many hours. And one of the, going back to the analysis point, one of the advantages of taking on responsibility for your analysis yourself is that you know, you can do that at midnight when your data, you know, your stats advisor isn't available to you and you've got half an understanding of what you're trying to achieve. Um, but uh, um, I, I certainly wouldn't go into this with the view that, that an RCT is really, is really more, more complex and more time consuming than this one. They're just different. One of the key things for, for uh, my findings is that my methodology didn't seek to capture who reported the repeat victimization offences. And I think that that's something that I would certainly change now um, if, I had, uh, if I was starting again. And um, it's, I think the trickiness is that it's difficult to, when you look at the repeat victimization outcomes, to say, well, of course, we would expect more reporting because our victims are, have had the benefit of an id for input and therefore they're more empowered and confident to report. And that might actually be the truth, but the answer is I can't answer that. But I might have been able to answer it if I'd, if I'd taken a note of, in my, in my data capture, was the person who reported the repeat victimization the victim themselves or was it a third party? Because that really affects the outcome of that and I can't answer that point. Something you will hear a lot during the course of your studies here is that correlation is not causation. So my research does not conclude that IDVAs cause lower conviction rates or increased repeat victimization, just that there's a correlation between those outcomes with the opportunity for an IDVA to, pro to provide support to victims at this court. And following on from that, my methodology does not Evidence, can only evidence the what, it can't evidence the why. And one of the struggles that I had and many conversations with my supervisor is that my cop brain would see an outcome and go, that's really interesting, why is that? It's like, no, stay away from the why, right? Your methodology is not going to answer the why, it's only going to give you the answer of the what. And I think um, if, if, you, if you take on some, some research of a similar type, the sooner you come to terms for that, the happier your life will be. And then the final question is, is anybody interested in the outcome? And um, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting question for me. I think that if my research had concluded that the opportunity for a victim at court on the day of trial to receive it for support does result in higher um, CJ outcomes and, um, and reduce victimization, everybody would say, that's just what we thought, thanks very much. But actually, because it's concluded something quite opposite, there's a lot of interest. Um, and it's interest, it's very early days for me. My thesis has only, been, uh, has only been submitted a month. But there are a few people who have stood on this type of platform and amongst other things have referenced the work that, that, that I've done and the findings that it's found. And it's generated quite a lot of contact in the background from people outside of academia but in, but in the workplace who want to, to learn more about it. So it has generated quite a lot of interest. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Um, thank you very much for your attention.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Wilson. I'm a DCI from Lancashire Constabulary. And I'm going to talk to you today about the research that I've been doing for the last 18 months around how to identify risk and harm in child exploitation. So my journey with this began in 2019. I really wasn't sure what I was going to do for my thesis. I knew that I absolutely loved working in vulnerability, particularly child protection and domestic abuse. Um, and then I was called to a gold meeting by the ACC for crime. So a lady called um, Chief Superintendent Mary Doyle, recently retired from GMP, had been asked to uh, conduct a bit of a health check on Lancashire Constabulary about our way that we approach child exploitation and our processes that we had in place. And as I sat and listened to her, a light bulb went on in my head and I thought, actually, this will be a perfect um, opportunity to draw on some of the recommendations that Mary's made. So I wanted to have a real good look at whether we um, identified risk and harm correctly in child exploitation. Uh, so Mary Doyle had had a bit of a tricky time. She had um, been involved in the investigation into the Rochdale um, CSE grooming investigation. She'd appeared before the Home Office um, Select Committee to answer some questions, so she was a perfect person to actually offer a view on how we were doing things in Lancashire. So, child sexual exploitation, CSE, um, has gathered traction in the last decade, and child criminal exploitation, CCE, probably in the last five years. So these are real high harm crimes um, that uh, attribute a lot of trauma to the victims. So if we don't get it right as police, not only does it cause really high harm, but it can lead to a loss of confidence and legitimacy in the police. Following on from serious case reviews, independent inquiries and also regulatory scrutiny um, in Rochdale, Oxford and Rotherham. A common theme developed and it was that police and other agencies didn't share information well at all. And so Lancashire Police, along with many other forces, responded to this in the form of child exploitation by creating multi-agency teams and also by holding monthly meetings called MACE. So they are monthly, uh, sorry, multi-agency child exploitation meetings. They're called different things in different forces. Sometimes you get CMET, children missing, exploited, trafficked. But the whole premise of these um, multi-agency meetings are to identify children who are most at risk of harm, high harm from child exploitation, and also to reduce that harm as well. In 2009, the government gave this direction to the police and they were quite clear. They said the role of the police is to assess and manage risk to children and young people, to prevent harm where possible, and to reduce the likelihood and the impact of any harm. So, if that is our role, we need to be able to identify risk correctly. MACE has never been subject to academic evaluation before, and the evidence base in child exploitation is limited. Uh, so, we can't target all child exploitation victims. Um, we just don't have enough resources to do that. So how do we choose who to target? So my first question, uh, research question, looked at what percentage of child exploitation repeat victims didn't go to MACE? And what harm did they experience 18 months after MACE compared to those children who did go? And then. I wanted to know a little bit more about what the victim offender overlap looked like in child exploitation and whether this was um, an area that would be effective to target. And then of the children who did go to MACE, I wanted to know what characteristics they had and whether those characteristics could be used to predict future harm. So the methodology, this was a whole population descriptive analysis of exploited children between the ages of 10 and 17 in Lancashire, 18 month period between January 2017 and June 2018. So that was 12,500 police victim and offender records. I used 18 month um, prior and follow up time censoring so I could see what harm had been caused before and what harm was caused after. And from that data, 1,859 exploitation victims were identified. I couldn't rely on the police flagging systems because, as it turns out, only 24% of the cases were flagged. So of those exploited victims, 494 were repeats, 
and the CCE victims were actually lifted from the offender data. They didn't show up as victims, uh, so they were identified as children who had been convicted of drugs trafficking or money laundering offences. So I had 174 MACE children and I applied the Cambridge Crime Harm Index um, to victimisations and offending. Uh, so, in terms of the findings for my first question, I realised that we had a problem. So 91% of CE repeat victims were excluded from MACE, which surprised me. So there was also no difference in the mean harm score that the children who went to MACE suffered compared to the children who didn't go to MACE. Looking at the most harmed child in that 18-month period, it was a 15-year-old female exploited victim with a harm score of 15,330. The highest frequency victim within that 18-month period was a 16-year-old male exploited victim with 31 victimizations, and neither of them went to MACE. None of the 56 children who were arrested for drug trafficking offences went to MACE. And then when I looked at the composition of MACE, actually only 36% of that cohort were exploited victims. So I thought I'd better try and see if there is another way to identify risk. So I looked at the victim offender overlap. So in 2018, Sandal et al. found that although victim offenders were a small group, actually they accounted um, for 50% um, of the group who caused the most harm. And they had a 75% higher harm score. So I thought, well, let's have a look and see what this looks like in child exploitation. So from my data, I disaggregated the cohorts, which you can see on that hexagon. Um, so I looked at different um, cohorts of children. The only cohort of children where victim offenders were mo most harmful were in the all-child cohort. So in terms of the repeat victims, the child exploitation victims, actually there was no difference in the harm the victim offenders caused in terms of victimisation. But what was um, apparent was that it was the repeat victimisation that actually increased the chances of being a victim offender. So the victim offender overlap is greater in repeat victimisation. But the harm score, which you can see on that red line, doesn't necessarily correlate with the size of the victim offender overlap. So the victim offender overlap, I concluded, isn't the way to go. So then I looked at, of the 174 children who did go to MACE, what are their characteristics? Um, so I looked at the ACEs that Lorraine talked about before, and I also looked at the trauma um, indicators, the tra trauma behaviours that children often display, such as going missing, self-harm, um, alcohol, drug abuse, etc. So in total, I coded 26 characteristics from the children who went to MACE. When Lorraine put up before the um, study about from Folletti in 1998, you could see actually uh, what the general prevalence of ACEs were in the population. These ACEs are massively overrepresented in the MACE cohort. And you can see the blue line there is um, children who have indicators for both CSE and CCE, and they are the most strongly represented group with the ACEs and the trauma behaviours. So from those characteristics, I looked to see if there was any way that we could predict harm from those characteristics. So I looked at the children who went on to um, have victimisation harm following MACE um, compared to those that didn't. And what I found was that there were 11 characteristics um, that correlated significantly with harm. So children who had markers for CSE and CCE, children who were uh, CCE markers and drug users, CCE and missing before and after MACE, and CCE children who were in residential care before MACE, all had harm following MACE, which was significantly correlated. Uh, boys who self-harmed, boys who had a learning disability, boys and whose parents were separated, and boys whose parents experienced domestic abuse, again, uh, those were characteristics that correlated with the harm, and girls uh, and all children who were looked after, became looked after by the local authority after MACE, um, had a uh, significantly um, 
a bigger correlation of, of being associated with harm. So then I looked at which children experience low harm, which is a harm score of less than 30, compared to which children experience high harm, which is a harm score of more than 200. And there were two um, predictors, which was alcohol and going missing after MACE. So that was my research question answered. And I should have been celebrating, excellent, I've done it, except... I hadn't really, I didn't feel like I'd answered my question, how can I best identify risk and harm because our current methods don't seem to be great. We're missing 91% of exploited victims. And something really odd had happened to me because I was now excited by data and I turned into a bit of a geek and I wasn't expecting that to happen. So my supervisor, Dr. Muller-Johnson, said to me, would you like to do some more calculations? And I got quite excited by that, but my analyst, Adam, didn't get excited. And it's at that point that I realized he liked Jack Daniels. So um, on I went to the Power Few uh, to see whether this was um, something that we could use to target uh, those most harmed, exploited victims. And I found some interesting things. 50% of all harm uh, was actually created by 2.9% of victims, 9.5% of exploited victims, 13% of C repeat victims and 15% of repeat victims. And then when I delivered my oral presentation to Professor Sherman, he said, yeah, that's really good, but does that tell you anything? Is it predictive? So this is six weeks before my thesis needed to be handed in to my supervisor. Um, and I thought it's too good a question not to have a look at. So following on some more Jack Daniels for my analyst, um, I separated my 18-month data and I looked at the children who are in the power few in the first nine months, do they show up again in the next nine months? And the answer is no, not in child victims, not in exploited child victims, not in repeat victims. Um, the residual power few was less than 2%. So the power few is not the way to go either in identifying the risk and harm for future interventions. So then I looked at repeat victimisation and I found that exploited victims are significantly more likely to be repeat victims. So if you are an exploited victim, you are twice, two times more likely um, to be a repeat victim. If you're a victim offender, you are three times more likely. And if you are a mace child, you are seven times more likely. So I disaggregated then the harm around the different ages. And between the ages of 10 and 17, the commonality here in terms of victim harm, who the most, who children who have the most victim harm, either it's victim offenders who were repeat CE victims or the repeat CE victims. So things started guiding me towards the CE repeat victims at this point. Interestingly, if you wanted to reduce offending harm by children, the victim offenders are the people to look at, but the victim offenders aren't the people to look at in um, the victim harm category. So then I thought, okay, well, let's have a look at the CU repeat victims. They sound quite interesting, and I applied conditional probability. And so those of you who are familiar with Matt Bland's and uh, Barack Ariel's work on domestic abuse and uh, the conditional probability will see actually that the results of conditional probability in child exploitation is really similar um, in terms of the likelihood of further victimizations and also the harm scores at the particular different incidents. So what I found is that 73% of child exploitation victims will have a one-time only victimization. 26% will go on to have a second. When you get to the chances of a third given a second, there is a 42% chance that children will have a third victimization and the harm starts creeping up. When you get to event four, if you've already had a third, there's a 49% chance that you're gonna have a fourth and the harm score, the mean harm score for that goes up a lot. So we don't want children to get to that point. So I concluded that actually the best way to target risk and harm in child exploitation is to target exploited victims at their second victimization. So you can't come to Cambridge and just 
present some findings, you have to actually say, so what? No way Sir Dennis would let us get away with that. So how would this work? So we could use this in a tiered approach to child exploitation. So we've already said before that 73% will come go, and what we do with those is effective. We have a police investigation, we share information with agencies. We don't need to do any more with them. For our tier twos, our 27% who will come again, and then with a 42% chance then of having a third, actually you can put a tested intervention in with this group. Um, and you could also identify the high-harmed power few for some trauma intervention as well. So clearly we don't know which 42% are actually going to go on and, and have the third. So the tested intervention would have to be applied to all of them. So in terms of tested interventions, um, there is one for child sexual exploitation which has been subject to an RCT. If I was to apply that intervention to all tier two children in Lancashire, it would cost £750,000. The savings, actually taking out the cost, would be between one and a half million to six and a half million pounds using a tool on the College of Policing website. Really difficult to quantify, but actually the savings outweigh the cost. And we're talking about children and their whole lives. We're talking about the impact that will have on their children's lives as well. So looking at the right thing to do and actually looking from a cost benefit analysis, um, I don't see why, why we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, so, thank you very much. So, we come to the end of this particular session, um, and I'd sum it up in a couple of words. Um, it's really useful to have something interesting, but actually, it's more useful for it to be useful. And actually, as leaders, we read so many things and think, oh, that's interesting, but we fail to do something with it that is useful. And so learning from a thesis and putting into practice is the key.